Royal Trinity. Good evening and welcome to Lithgow City Council January meeting, our first meeting for the elected new council. So welcome everyone. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are on here today and pay my respect to their elders, both past, present and emerging. The declarations of webcasting. I inform all those in attendance at this meeting that the meeting is being webcast and that those in attendance should refrain from making any defamatory statements concerning any person, councillor or employee, and refrain from discussing those matters subject to closed council proceedings as indicated in clause 14.1 of the Code of Meeting Practice. Do we have any apologies this afternoon? Uh, councillor Bryce? Oh, she's there. No, we have, we have councillor. Okay, no apologies. Any declarations of interest? Declaration of interest. Uh, confirmation of the minutes of the 22nd of November 2021. That would have to be a councillor that attends. Happy that to meeting. move, Mayor Statham. Councillor Cole. Happy to second. And a second to Councillor Goodsell. All those in favour say aye. Thank you. And for somebody please to second and move the minutes of the 22nd of December 2021. Happy to move again, Mayor Statham. Thank you, Councillor Coleman, and a seconder, thank you. Now, we can only have people that were attending that meeting, I'm sorry. Councillor Goodsell, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Thank you, Carrie. On behalf of Lithgow City Council and General Manager and staff, I would like to express our sincere condolences for those families who have lost loved ones since our last council meeting. There will be a chance tonight with announcements if anybody wishes to make an announcement about an upcoming event. Uh, I know Rydal Show is going to be on in a couple of weekends, so anything that you think is in particular important to our, our local government area, uh, please um, stand up now and um, announce what you would like to. Thank you. I've got one, Miss Statham. Yes, Councillor Goodsell. So, um, not sure if the Council is aware, but we are a... a dementia-friendly community. Yes. Um, there's a, a, a walk on uh, this Saturday that's been organised by the Dementia Awareness Association in conjunction with the Lithgow Dementia Awareness Group. Um, they're doing some fantastic work in our community at the moment and the walk will be on, you can register online and it'll be lovely to see as many of us there as possible on Saturday. And it's um, changed location from the Tony Lucchetti Sports Ground to Wattsford Oval this Saturday. Um, the time, Council Goodsell? 100% sure you have to register and, and you, it's between maybe 8 and 5, but you can register for, to attend from whatever time you like. All right, thank you. Any others? We'll move straight into public forum, thank you. So our first speaker this evening... Sorry, Councillor Statham, I've just got one more question. So yes, with the change to the commemorations and announcements, and I think it's fitting that you're doing the whole lot up at once and we're not individually recognising members that we've lost or that we know, um, it, do we have to amend a, a terms of reference or such to reflect that? Mr General Manager? I don't know that we do. It's really just uh, become a practice and there was... Uh, um, really just some parameters in terms of matters that qualify uh, for, for being dealt with at that in that section of the business paper. But certainly I'll have a look at it and there'll be an opportunity probably at the February information session just to uh, bounce some of these things around if there's any clarification. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with it whatsoever. I just wondered. Thank you, Councillor Goodsell. So for tonight for Public Gallery, there are several people going to address the audience. Martin Smith, would you like to come forward, please? Uh, thank you, Mayor, councillors and council staff. Um, I'm here to just put a bit of a human perspective on the recent flooding event or rain event that occurred on the 11th of January. I've been living in Lithgow now for just over five years. My residence is on Main Street between Cupro and Lawrence Street, between the Fast Fox, if you know that, and Bunnings. Um, when we had the 
the flooding event on the 11th that was the worst that I have seen in the five years that I've been here. Um, in that five years that I've been here, it typically the street floods about two to three times per year. Um, and all of those occasions, I remember the first time it happened, I was always concerned, was I going to get up and get my house? And it didn't. And so I watched these floods occur two to three times a year. And anyway, I watched this one and it just came up and I said, oh, it's not going to come up any higher. And it just kept coming up and it just kept kept coming up. Um, it sort of went through my whole property. The back of my property was half a metre deep in water and the front of the property on the street was probably about a metre and a half. So that means there wasn't a dry patch on my block of land. All the floors in the house were underwater. I'm, I've been totally devastated um, and I'm very anxious that it's going to happen again, of course. Um, I have informed council two times that I'm aware of in the last three to four years of this event, and I've asked them to sort of look at the problem. The problem where I am is twofold. Um, it's stormwater not getting away, but also the sewage system is inadequate. And so the sewage system overflows and the sewage system overflows into the stormwater. So all of that water that is going through my house, across my property, all over the area is contaminated with sewer. As far as I'm aware, that needs to be reported to the EPA um, because that's going into the water catchment of Sydney. Um, apart, from, apart from how I'm feeling, I really, want to see some movement on this, some improvement of the infrastructure. Um, I am willing, if you've got um, council engineers, if they would come to my place and I would point out all of the issues that I see surrounding my property. I can probably point to half a dozen places where I know sewers coming out. Um, I know the way the stormwater drains block up. I can, I can read it like a book when it's happening, because it's the same story every single time. Um, just finally, anecdotally, I've been cleaning up my property and some locals have been walking by and I've been talking to them. And some of them have been living in Lithgow for 60 years. And I got a comment today from one fellow saying, this has been like this for 60 years. So it's clear to me that council must know about this problem. Um, and it's just, I aware, I'm aware that money is always a problem when it comes to all of these things. And I'm sure across the, the council, there's probably hundreds of other equally important um, issues to do with stormwater and sewer that want to be attended to. But I, I would really, really like the council to take a serious look at this because it's, um, it's affecting the lifestyle and it's sort of like, it looks pretty bad if you've got a big pile of sewer going past your swimming pool down into Farmer's Creek. All right, thank you for your time. Uh, Mr Smith, I'd like you uh, to hear Jonathan Edgecombe. He's, got, he's listened to you and he'd like to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. He's our engineer. Hi, Mr Smith. Um, firstly, I'd like to express my um, sympathy for everything that you've experienced over the last couple of weeks. I, I can't, under, I can't uh, understand how traumatic that must have been to have your, your property flooded to the extent that it was. And yeah, I'm, be, I'm very sorry that that's happened to you. Uh, but I'd also like to add that I am aware, I, I'm a Lithgow resident myself, um, I'm aware that this issue has been persistent. And while I haven't been with council for a long time, uh, it has been one of the projects that we've uh, held close um, because we believe that it uh, it really absolutely should be fixed for the reasons that you've outlined. Uh, we do have a scope and a project that's been developed to directly resolve this issue. Uh, it was very difficult and a, a lot of engineering know-how went into to developing these plans, um, but essentially the, the project will see a, an array of new inlets and uh, triplication of the pipe work underneath the Watsford-Conran Oval area. So it'll see 
the flood capacity in that area dramatically increase. Um, however, uh, while we've done, while council and the administration have gone to great lengths to in, in attempts to lobby for the funding required, which is about between one and a half and two million dollars to complete this work. Unfortunately, to, to date, um, the, uh, this project hasn't been deemed a priority. So we'll be continuing our efforts. We'll be advocating extremely hard to the extent, to the absolute extent that we can uh, to make this project a reality. Um, but once more, I, I, I sympathise with your with your issues and I hope very much that we can fix this in the near future. If I could comment. Um, if you would like me to write a letter to any state or federal ministers and if you would help me word it so that it would um, be appropriate and not too blasphemous, then I'm more than welcome to help the council get these funds that it needs to get for this project. I think that's a very good idea, Mr Smith. You might like to um, speak to Jonathan Edgecombe after the meeting or if you're going to leave before the meeting finishes, I think Jonathan should get your contact details before you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, our second speaker this evening is Mr Brian Giblet. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I too wish to raise the issue of um, the sewage system in the area of Main Street and Calero, or Main Street from Calero to Lowry Street. And what I'd like to, to do is to have the focus of the council actually on the sewer, not so much the stormwater. Mr Smith quite um, eloquently put the case for both stormwater and sewage. But the problem that I see across that Main Street intersection is, yes, it does flood and floods regularly. And everybody, and yes, Mr Edkin, I understand that we're going to have some sort of a, a program. I can't find that program, by the way. But the biggest issue that faces these people is the sewer. The sewer floods every time that significant rainfall event occurs and floods Main Street. I sent several of the council members a, a video of the sewer coming out of the, um, the vent in 291 Main Street. And I'm sure Mr Smith would only agree that there was two houses up, sewer actually went through their house. That sewer with lumps and bumps and all those other things that people put down the sewer, actually when they ran out of my, um, my in-law's house at 291 Main Street and onto the footpath and then merrily down the road. It's not in my opinion about getting the stormwater fixed, which I understand is a huge issue. The issue is getting that sewer fixed. If you went through the lane, on, during that rain excursion, the lane was bubbling some, some three or four feet high out of the sewer lanes. I contacted the council, gave them my phone number. They assured me they would bring me back. They were very busy. Nobody contacted me. Nobody rang me back. I sent a letter to council and several of the councillors, and thank you, Mayor, you passed it on to um, the council officer appropriate. And what he said in his reply, was that the property's existing draining system seems to be operating correctly if the discharge is occurring outside of the home and not indoors. Well, isn't that great? You can't use the toilet in any one of those rain excursions and not just the 11th of January. Let's not, I don't want to just focus on the 11th of January. This sewerage discharge has been an ongoing issue for many, many years. Every time it leaks, every time there's a rain discharge into Main Street. Surely the system is not working properly when raw sewage bubbles out of the main situated in the lane. Bunnings themselves actually came out and, and barricaded the lane so you couldn't drive down there because the sewage was coming out of the main in such a large amount. The rear of 291, the sewer was bubbling out of there. And as I say, the video I sent to the, um, the past councils, I didn't send it to the new councils. And there's a reason for that and I'll come to it. But it's not limited just to that one event. Every time it rains, the stormwater floods and the stormwater brings with it a sewerage flood as well. Surely that is not acceptable. And, and why I didn't send it to all the other councillors. Last year, this council approved $300,000 to be taken out of the sewer fund and transferred to the general fund. As there was $200,000 the year before and as there was $200,000 this year. We just heard from Mr Edgecombe, we can't get one point something million dollars in grants to be able to fix the stormwater. We took $700,000 out of a viable sewer fund. Why can't we put that back in and fix this problem for the people of, of Main Street and the people of Lithgow? Because if you're all walking past that intersection, whenever there's a rainfall event, you are walking in sewer. 
Simple as that. And I, I think Mr. Smith said, surely that's an EPA identifiable um, issue. And we should have been telling them that, yes, the sewer was pelting down your drain. So, Ms. Uh, so Mayor, I, I appreciate the time. I had, I had a, a, a speech, but Mr. Smith more eloquently put it because he is a, a, a landowner in that area. I only speak on behalf of my in-laws, but it is a huge problem. It's not about stormwater, it's sewer. The stormwater, I think, well, we can't live with it, but I understand that. We can't live with that sewer every time we get a significant rain event, flooding and then flooding in the main street and down through houses. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Kiblett. Number three tonight is Mr. John Lowe. Councillors, uh, I would like to um, direct my um, to the subdivision at 909 Genome Cage Road, uh, property known as Anfield. Um, my, I, I've made no secrets that I have concerns about the development as it stands, um, but probably my main attention at this point is uh, whether or not uh, Transport New South Wales excuse me, has um, given concurrence to the works uh, would be required for access to the, um, the road. And I am not, I would like a clarification as to whether or not the uh, works um, the the um, with concurrence that would also include lot the entrance to lots one to three because um, at the moment safe line of sites for lots one to three to enter Genelon Cage Road doesn't go anywhere near um, meeting the Osroad standards for um, safe intersections uh, by oh, over 100 metres. Um, Genelon Cage Road carries a mix of trucks and tourist traffic. Tourist traffic especially are not often not concentrated on the road. They're busy looking at the views and uh, they're nice views. Uh, and my concern is if the council uh, approves the development without the minimum standards, uh, there could be an issue of uh, liability um, should a serious accident take place at the Antill entrance. Uh, I'm also um, concerned about, still concerned about the shape of the blocks, uh, long thin blocks, uh, despite assurances, do make uh, weed control much more difficult. It also makes uh, best practice for integrated pest management plans very difficult, if not impossible, uh, as in best practice, uh, two of the um, use uh, methods are, um, are shooting of uh, pest animals and also um, using poison baits. Uh, I know there's people who have different opinions on on those methods, uh, but long thin blocks and the buffers required for those um, practices uh, make uh, most of those blocks quarantined as far as uh, useful pest animal control methods go. Uh, will we um, trying to control our pests? We don't want more coming across the road uh, from our neighbours, uh, uh, not to mention the extra load on uh, other uh, commercial farm holders uh, in the district trying to um, do the notifications. Uh, the issue to me seems is with, uh, and it's, it's probably more a general concern uh, that should be put towards future LEPs, small blocks like this uh, are a little knife into um, larger landholders who are trying to make their living off the land. Uh, and eventually we'll probably succumb and you'll get a lot more little blocks uh, and all the issues that council has to face that goes with that. So if that's what you want in the future, that's it. But uh, to me, it makes our business much harder. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lowe. Charles Lowe, you're under the next speaker, Charles. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Councillors. I'd simply like to reframe and reiterate some of the points that John made regarding the subdivision at Anhill. I oppose the subdivision in its current form, as if it goes ahead, it will have permanent harmful consequences. The elongated shapes of the plots, as John mentioned, would make them incredibly difficult to manage, 
as you would need to maintain a lot of boundary for comparatively little land. This is further exacerbated by the incredibly steep landforms that would make managing these blocks almost impossible. As a grazer myself and from the wisdom of my peers and neighbours, I can fairly confidently say that no one with any sort of meaningful agricultural experience will consider these lots viable. And given the current plans evolving of converting much of the key farm infrastructure, such as stables and sheds into houses, they're clearly geared towards creating lifestyle blocks as opposed to productive and sustainable agriculture. A combination of impractical boundaries, steep terrain and likely inexperienced owners is a perfect storm for the properties being badly managed. And if the plots are badly managed, there is a very real possibility that they could become a harbour for invasive weeds and feral animals that could go on to afflict the whole region. It would be like if rats began to infest the house next door and started spilling over into your own. No matter how well you may bait, trap and control the rats in your own home, for as long as their safe harbour remains, you will be doing it forever. I wish to make it clear, I do not oppose all subdivisions. I simply oppose this subdivision in its current form, as it attempts to carve Ant Hill into far too many separate properties. A way to possibly address these concerns is to have fewer subdivisions, for example, three or four separate lots instead of seven. What the current plan will do, intentionally or no, is to permanently fragment a valuable agricultural asset into lifestyle housing, making a prime agricultural land ever more scarce. If this plan does somehow meet regulation, then perhaps there is cause for the regulation to be reviewed. And I ask the council and all present whether this is really the kind of future we want to create. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Charles. Mr. Chris McEwen, thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Councillors, Council Officers. Um, I am the applicant for seeking approval for the seven lot subdivision. I have heard what the objectors say and I will seek to address those matters as part of my proposal. I note that a number of um, members of the council uh, were able to come and view the property last Monday, at which time the matter was discussed in some depth, but I also note that a number of councillors were unable to come, so I will have to, if you'll excuse me, go back over some old ground. The application, as the report makes clear, seeks to create seven lots. It does this by consolidating 22 existing lots into seven lots of various sizes, which range between 40 hectares and 60 hectares. Importantly, it complies with all the council rules and requirements. Uh, the 40 hectare rule being a rule which plainly is contained within the council LEP and may reasonably be expected to uh, indicate to persons who wish to subdivide the land that subject to it being appropriate, it is of a size which council regards as appropriate for the area. Each of the lots, despite the comments which have been made, have in fact been designed and surveyed so as to make the best use of the existing topography and the tracks and to ensure that each lot remains manageable sought to work with the land and not against it. Each lot has access from Denolan Caves Road. Most of the lots, if approved, will have shared entries to reduce any possible conflict on the road. With one exception, those entries already exist. The property has three dwellings, which are currently separately occupied, as well as an 80 metre by 20 metre brick stable and a 30 metre by 20 metre brick shed. Each of these structures will be placed on individual lots if the application were to be approved. Each lot has access to power. Five of the seven lots already have approved septic systems installed. To elaborate on that, that is each of the three houses, plus the stable block, plus the shed which had historically 
quite a large butchery attached to the site of it. They're all registered and approved by Lithgow Council in terms of their septic capacity. The land is suitable primarily for cattle grazing and there is no reason for that not to continue. The subdivision will not be out of character. There are numerous examples of 40 hectare lots already in existence and indeed smaller lots. My own property uh, has out of it in the centre a 40 acre lot, a 40 acre lot which is occupied and farmed. There are at the bottom of the property at the east end the number of uh, 2.5 to 4 hectare lots um, and they appear to manage the land in an appropriate way. I certainly haven't heard any objections. In terms of the objectors and objections, they have been fully dealt with in the council officers' reports. Complaints of uh, reduced agricultural production and unmanageable land have been addressed by a report and by the council staff, and I'll come to that in a moment. Increase in weeds and feral animals, that has also been addressed by report. Uh, in my respectful um, submission, it's one thing to say that if you divide it into seven lots, it won't be manageable. I don't, with respect, accept that. Uh, the alternative is you leave it as one lot and you may get one owner who decides that it's not in their interests to maintain 775 acres and you could get exactly the same result. Yes, the land is steep, and yes, the lots may appear on paper to be narrow, but the council staff have looked at that very carefully and have come to the positive conclusion that they are well designed and managed to overcome concerns about productivity and management. Uh, in terms of the way in which the application has been addressed, I've mentioned the council staff, the matter was referred formally to the Rural Fire Service. They have granted a 100B certificate and have thereby approved of the subdivision, if it be approved by the council, subject, of course, to conditions, all of which can easily be satisfied. In terms of concerns about traffic, I have lodged with the council a traffic report from a traffic expert. Uh, I do not agree that there is any shortfall in the site distances for any of the entries, bearing in mind that the one which is, seems to be of concern is an existing entry already, and there is no history whatsoever of road accidents, but more particularly, the expert report has measured those entrances, and he concludes, and the council has that report, that they all meet the relevant requirements of the RMS and all of the relevant standards that are necessary. And Mr McCune, would you like an extension? If I may. The time has gone. Can somebody please move? Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Have a second to thank you, Councillor Goodsell. All those in favour say aye. Thank you. You can thank extend you, that. Madam. Thank you. Um, in terms of um, the management of the land, there is an agronomic inspection report which was uh, provided in November last year in response to the objections which were made by in respect of the three objections that the council received. That is available to be read, but if I could just reference page four, paragraph 12, Mr. Harbison, a person with 30 years agronomic experience and whose profession is to give advice in these matters, says there is nothing particularly unusual or unique about this land by comparison to surrounding land, should, which should cause it to be treated contrary to the LEP and subdivision controls, which indicate to owners and neighbours that council regards 40 hectare lots as an acceptable land size to preserve primary production capability within the RU1 zone. He says, from my observations, the seven, the proposed subdivision into seven productive and more manageable lots is better aligned with the topography, does not compromise the rural stocking capacity of the land, the reconfigured lots are the product of taking into consideration topographical constraints and opportunities. He says by way of conclusion, the subdivision, more correctly an amalgamation into seven lots, is likely to result in a beneficial and sustainable agricultural outcome for the land which will not compromise its future productivity. The council staff, um, Madam Mayor, councillors, also considered this matter and uh, you have, of course, before you the full council report. <clears throat> I simply want to reference the conclusion. 
which um, having dealt with all of the objections and all of the matters relevant, says <clears throat> the public interest is best served by the orderly and economic use of land for permissible land uses that does not impact unreasonably on the use of development of surrounding land. In general, the proposal is considered to be in the public interest, the reconfiguration of 22 disjointed and fragmented lots that are poorly configured over the site into seven new lots with boundaries more aligned with the topography, each with frontage to Janolan Caves Road is considered a favourable outcome. The subdivision will facilitate and enable the ongoing and future use of land for agricultural activities and associated rural purposes. Your time is now up. I'm sorry, Mr Thank McEwen. I hope you're happy with what you are um, just conclude, Madam Mayor, by tonight. saying I would ask you to take into account all of the relevant advice, particularly that of the Council staff, and to approve the application subject to the proposed conditions. Thank you for extending the time. Thank you. Mr Bruce Richardson. Uh, th <coughs> thank you, um, Madam Mayor. Um, councillors and staff. Um, my name's Bruce Richardson. I live at Glen Alice in the Cavity Valley. I've been there since 1965. I'm on the statutory uh, government body uh, for the RFS of the Bushfire Management um, Committee and I'm the local captain of the Glen Alice Brigade. I rise to support uh, Councillor McGee's notice of motion in uh, tonight's agenda regarding roadside vegetation. Uh, it's a very prolonged subject of mine, um, as uh, you'll probably find out, Madam Mayor, when you chair, if you chair the next Bushfire Management Committee meeting on February 1st. I've been raising this for many years, and <clears throat> as a result of Ralston Shire's um, been split up in, um, on the 26th of May 2004. We were addressed by the then management of Lithgow City Council and, and visited by most councillors at the Glen Alice Hall where we were assured that roadside vegetation would be um, managed. This has been far from the case. I note in the managerial comments in the notice of motion, the extent of the roads uh, that council has to look after. Many councils have adopted uh, chemical usage as well as other um, mechanical means such as graders and um, slashes and swing arm um, slashes. It was deemed by many people and I was a part of what was a Glen Alice Community Association roadside uh, uh, council committee and we managed um, to liaise with uh, Ralston Council in those days on roadside vegetation management. Unfortunately, back in the time of the Ralston Council, um, a um, somewhat radical conservationist hung off the bucket of a excavator on Louis Road. Uh, and from that day on, with the, the kerfuffle that followed that, um, there was no um, liaising with the Glen Alice Community Association Roadside Management Committee. The stumps of the trees that were removed on Louis Road are still there today. Uh, and after, I would imagine, 25 years, Last year was the first time that that section of road was revisited for capital works in terms of the drainage and other issues with that particular section of road. The Glen Alice, um, the Cavey Valley roads are now suffering from roadside vegetation, both big trees, um, shrubs, grass, and there is no way that seasons like we've had this year should be used as an excuse. If there had been chemical usage, the burden from the road would not be as significant as what it is at the moment. 
and in particular road leading to our property, Upper Nile Road, which has lines on it, one lane is now back to 1.3 metres with, with vegetation imposing on the roadway. So it's basically back to a one-lane road and growing in, out of the bitumen are tree suckers. Now, apart from the abhorrent um, situation where ratepayers can see mismanagement happening to their council roads, um, surely it cannot be deemed as a um, good usage of council assets to, to allow this to happen. Um, I'm aware that most things that are done in Lithgow Council of late are, are centred around financial management, and that's a real pity because in the end, this is all going to cost us a lot more money through bad management. And, and I am for proactive measures being taken rather than, re than reactionary measures being taken. And so the little trees that I'm talking about that are growing out of the road now become big trees. And I could take you from Glen Alice to Ralston and to Capeny, and I could show you every tree that wasn't there at the period following the person hanging off the bucket of the excavator. And you you have access to money that, that governments are <coughs> uh, making available for um, roadside vegetation management through RFS, and Jonathan uh, touched on that at a BFMC meeting with the uh, constraints that Lithgow Council has had with that. Sir Richardson, would you like an extension? Uh, if I could, please, Madam would Mayor. Um, not sure who was next. Councillor Goodsell, thank you. All those in favour say aye. Thank you. We've got two minutes. I won't be long, Madam Mayor. Um, and <clears throat> also, I believe that um, councils through the Blue Mountains, uh, Oberon, uh, Bathurst and Mudgee, make use of Transport New South Wales funding. And uh, I'm led to believe that um, Lithgow Council has not accessed this funding and it was, it's because they um, are reluctant to be compliant with the conditions that are set into, into, that, um, into that funding. So I would ask the, the new council to, to look into this. Um, the Wollamai fire came to the Capity Valley from the eastern side, which is not considered a threat as normal. We all saw initial boundaries that were, could always be held during fires um, become very hard to, to strategically contain the fire. I've been speaking in my captain's reports to our brigade for probably 12 years about the threat coming off Airland and Allen roads, uh, mountains, and, and coming across onto Glen Alice Ralston Road and the, and the Glen Davis Capity Road. And so our prevailing weather in the valley is west southwesterly, and with um, strategic changes in grazing to lifestyle blocks in the valley from that, that western southwestern sector, um, we as as volunteers are going to need the strategy of being able to use the road. And if it has vegetation growing on it and trees canopying over the road, it becomes very difficult to control. Um, I have nothing further to say other than uh, I and my brigade members and other members of the community are available should any council staff wish to meet with us and talk about issues regarding roadside vegetation and, and any changes in your strategies to dealing with it. Uh, I can help you with contractors if you decide to move down the chemical way. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr Richardson. Last but not least, um, Mr Jeremy Dawkins. Thank you. Congratulations and councillors uh, on your election um, at a very critical time for this go, I think. Uh, we're facing, as you're all aware, big challenges and uh, can meet them um, 
with very big opportunities. One of the ways that uh, the Council is meeting the challenges of the future is through the, the Lithgow Emerging Economy Project. I, I guess it was deliberate, but it was called LEAP. Um, and uh, you have engaged highly expert people, uh, particularly the economists, to help you with this. And uh, they will help you with it in um, a fairly unusual way in that this project is not just go away and come back with a report, um, go and produce this. It's, it's what the general manager calls outcomes um, directed project, which, um, in which the consultants will work with you to identify uh, the facts and the situation and then the issues, challenges and the responses to them and the way forward. And the, and the brief, which I hope all councillors will read, uh, calls for pauses in the project so that uh, there is an opportunity for, for councillors, staff and stakeholders and members of the public to catch up with the consultants, to know what's been found, to work, to, to consider uh, responses to what they've found and to um, uh, develop a way forward and to guide them in the next in the next phase. Alongside this is the local uh, strategy plan review and clearly these two things are closely related and I think they should go in tandem all year because clearly the local strategy plan should reflect what's coming out of LEAP and vice versa. LEAP should, um, should incorporate what's coming out of the review of the local strategy plan. Uh, this is not easy to do, but I think if you take the time and use the pauses in the LEAP project, then uh, the two of them should produce a very um, useful outcome. Uh, the, one, of the, one of the assets of, of Lithgo, to mention it, uh, is the sort of place that Bill Hartley is, uh, an extraordinary, unique nationally combination or cluster of the earliest farms and the earliest inns from the very first uh, transition to the inland. You might call it uh, the birth of the bush. Lithgow is the birth of the bush in that sense. And, and since those early days, new technologies, innovation, enterprise and so on in the valley without destroying a fantastic uh, environment and and these historic places until the Great Western Highway comes through and bulldozes through the very middle of Little Hartley, a divided 100 kilometer an hour freeway. And not only that, conks down in the middle of Little Hartley, a massive interchange, a freeway interchange with on-ramps and off-ramps and bridges and so on. Right where this, right where the the assets of the multifaceted asset uh, that Lithgow has there uh, are located, leaving, for instance, the extraordinarily interesting uh, Harbour Baron Inn stranded on, uh, essentially on a, on a roundabout. The report you have on the Great Western Highway is very measured, very, very um, thorough measured report, but there's no way a strategy of putting a double lane um, freeway with interchange on top of the Little Hartley cluster uh, would come out of the local strategy plan or LEAP. It's the last thing they would, that would come out of those strategies. And I think the council has to be much stronger, much clearer that it's unacceptable. The whole project is probably doesn't have a positive cost benefit analysis. But when you add in the cost to our future of all those assets and the ways they they make sense economically, then it's way negative, must be. And lastly, um, Madam Mayor, the, all of these things influence the LEP. The, whatever the strategies are coming out of this work that you're doing this year should flow into the LEP. The LEP should be a live document that is regularly uh, reviewed and, and, and amended and so on. And it sure does need it. And I'm sure the strategies that come out of this, what I think will be a very productive year, should 
be reflected as soon as possible in the LEP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dawkins. We'll move now on to two mayoral minutes. First mayoral minute tonight is for the Australia Day 2022. As an Australia Day approaches, I would like to speak of what this day will mean for me. Also, I will take this opportunity to inform the Council and the community of the range of Australia Day activities to be held in Lithgow, Portland and Wallerawang this Wednesday. I like the fact that Australia Day does cause us to pause and reflect on what it means to be Australian. When I do this, I conclude that we have much to celebrate in our community, despite some of the challenges we have confronted in the past two years. These challenges have really highlighted to me the resilience of this amazing community. I feel that it is because we have a strong sense of community, and so, as a result, we look out for each other. I think we can also rightly recognise and celebrate that the Lithgow region is a most welcoming and inclusive place. It is often said that Australians are egalitarian, but in Lithgow you can see that in practice. Australia Day is a timely opportunity to again acknowledge the committed work of those who have been the first responders during the coronavirus pandemic because they have put our safety and well-being before their own. The Australia Day Ambassador for 2022 is James Chapman, OLY. Known for his achievements in national, international and Olympic rowing, James Chapman is proud to be an Australia Day Ambassador and to join in our community celebrations. James will give an address at the Lithgow and Portland ceremonies. I've been very fortunate to have met James in Lithgow once before. Lithgow's official ceremony will be held at Queen Elizabeth Park from 10am to 11am with a citizenship ceremony, the New South Wales Local Citizenship Awards and the Ambassador's Address. If it is raining, the event will intend to be held at the same time at the Union Theatre. There will also be free entry to the Lithgow Aquatic Centre all day. Wallerawang celebrations will take part and place in Wallerawang Community and Sports Club from 10.30am. The Portland community will be able to celebrate Australia Day with family and friends in Walgan Street, Portland from 10am. The official ceremony commences at midday and I look forward to participating in these events again with our Australia Day Ambassador. Unfortunately, there is the need to reduce entertainment and food stalls at the locations in with the line of COVID restrictions and COVID safe measures. We will place for all on all of the sites, but I am sure that this will not dim diminish our local community from embracing the spirit of Australia Day. The recommendation, the Council note the range of Australia Day activities to be held in Lithgow, Portland or Larrawing. My second... Can we speak on that, Madam Mayor? Yes, sir. If that's okay. Um, I know that you don't need a seconder for your Mayor a minute, but I would like to speak to her if that was okay. Certainly. Same. Um, I too am looking forward to Australia Day this year. It is a great opportunity to catch up with residents in both Lithgow and Portland celebrations. It is disappointing that due to timing that Larrawang Wang Lidsdale Progress Association had to organise their own ambassador, which I believe is gold medal Olympian Susie Bagog. I think that's how you say it, OAM. Susie is a sports shooter. I think that it would be best to avoid any upsets that we consult with all appropriate groups regarding Australia Day as early as possible going into the future, if we could, please. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. May Statham, I had a comment as well, if that's okay? Yes, certainly. Um, thank you for your comments and raising the awareness in our, com in our community about what the events that are taking place across our local government area. Um, and for most Australians, the 26th is a day of celebration and um, to appreciate what indeed a lucky country and community we live in. But I believe more importantly, it's a day to pause and reflect and acknowledge our First Nations residents and families in our community from the past, the present and into the future. Thank you, Councillor Goodsell. Anybody else wishing to speak? The second mayoral minute. Sorry, just briefly, uh, Mayor Stephen. Uh, just...
and it, sorry, okay. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of stresses in our community and they've been central to responding to natural disasters and COVID. And so I appreciate the time you take and to speak to that. I also want to support Deanna, uh, sorry, Councillor Goodsell's um, statement. I think it's important that we recognise our First Nations people in this process and, um, and also support that. So thank you both for your, your comments. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. The second uh, Adam Mayor, we do need to actually put that motion. Yes, I will put that motion. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Unanimous, thank you. The second notice of uh, Merrill Minute is rather a, um, a sad one. On Tuesday, the 11th of January 2022, a large rain event hit Lithgow and Wollerowang, causing major flooding of roads and buildings. Initial estimates rate the event as a one in 1,000 year rain event, and this gives an indication as to why the impact was widespread across private and public assets. In Lithgow Main Street was flooded in two sections between Enfield Avenue and Calero Street, with up to a metre of rain flowing across the road, across Main Street. Many businesses in the Lithgow area experienced extensive flooding in their buildings, extensive stock losses, building damage and disruption to businesses. Many houses were inundated with damage to flooring and furnishings. In Wollerowang, the impact area was more localised with a river of water flowing down Rydal Road and across Piper's Flat Road with property damage in the immediate area. Council immediate pursued a declaration of natural disaster. This has been approved and this will provide support for council, businesses and residents as a clean-up and rebuilding takes place. Cost of the damage to council assets will likely be over a million dollars. The total cost of the damage will be much greater when you include the damage to private property. There is little that can be done to prevent the damage caused by this size event. Stormwater assets were flowing to capacity and the overflow paths were exceeding their design limits. All of this combined with Farmers Creek flowing at an extremely high level meant there was there were no there was nowhere for the water to go. I want to acknowledge the work of council staff as well as all the first responders, such as the police and SES. When the various issues caused by the rain event in Lithgow and Wollerowang started to present, council staff stepped up and did whatever was required to make the streets as safe as possible. This included road closures, barricading dangerous areas, inspecting areas as calls were received and working in the emergency services as needed. Council staff were key in protecting the public, going to an extent of rescuing a driver trapped in floodwaters. Council supplied sand to the SES for sandbagging and worked in with requests from the community to help with flooding issues where they could. The next few days were spent patching and assessing roads assessing and cleaning stormwater drains, assessing and responding to damage on building assets. By Friday afternoon, the roads and stormwater drains were patched and cleared. Buildings were cleaned and repairs had been started and plans for more extensive work are underway. One of the main impacts was a collapse in a 40 metre section of the retaining wall on the banks of the Farmers Creek. This was not due to the high flow in the creek, but the flow of water across Glenmire Oval. The retaining wall was not designed to withstand water flows of this magnitude from Glenmire Oval, but to protect the embankment from the flow in Farmers Creek. Council is now looking at the following plans to further protect and build environment from these events. Improve the flow of water to Farmers Creek and away from built up areas of Lithgow by improving or expanding the stormwater system. As assets are, required, are repaired, they will be armoured against events of this nature where possible. Improving drainage at Piper's Flat Road in the vicinity of Rydal Road to avoid water flowing across the road. Additional drainage around certain buildings that are susceptible to flooding. Council will work with the state and federal grant programs to ensure that new or improved stormwater assets are constructed to a higher capacity to help with avoid these events having such a detrimental effect. I look forward to these governments assisting council as they have done in the past. Can I have somebody please accept that report? Any comments on it? I'd like to speak to it if I may, Mayor Statham. 
Um, I too would like to acknowledge the staff and the first responders, but one in particular, I would provide the gentleman's name to the general manager after the meeting. A resident made contact with me and this particular council worker single-handedly pushed, pushed this resident's car out of a flooded area at great risk to himself. And this occurred in James Street and this particular staff member, and I'll let Mr Butler know afterwards, deserves recognition for that. Uh, look, Coleman, I have already seen to that and I think he's going to be acknowledged on Australia Day. That's great. Thank you, Mayor Statham. Can I speak, Mayor Statham? I'd like to um, also thank the people that come and spoke tonight and that, that their properties were flooded significantly. I was also one of those um, homes, not particularly in that area in Main Street, but in another area where my property was flooded with a, a foot or so of water through it. Um, and what I'd like to say is thank you, um, Mayor Statham, for your, that was a very good Merrill Minute. And I, I'd like to particular thank the staff and Rachel Nickel, who um, the staff have quickly put together a register. So people affected in those floods, not me necessarily particularly, I don't need it, but um, it's nice to be in the loop with those emails, but they're going to support our residents with the cleanup um, if they need it. Um, and in particular, my resident next door, who's 84 years old and 82 years old, they have, were contacted by Rachel Nickel. They don't have the internet, they don't have email. She's navigating that process for them with um, supporting her through that process of, of insurance. So that was really, really valuable and that's happened in the first week. So I'd like, like to um, pass on my thanks to that team and whoever's running that team and, and to Rachel Nickel. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Goodsell. Councillor Leslie. Uh, th thank you, Mayor Statham. I was just wondering if I could also ask some, some questions in relation to uh, what we heard at public forum. Uh, Mr Smith, for example, mentioned that uh, the uh, that matters like this should be reported to the EPA, you know, with, with especially with the flooding and, and, the, and, the, and the, the fact of sewerage in, in, in people's properties. So I was wondering if that, that has happened. Uh, but and the other other thing is that I note I note that there's also a uh, a notice of motion from Councillor Marnie coming up, which which deals with a number of issues and how we can uh, pr proceed with it. But this this particular Merrill minute, yeah, it, it's 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 very extensive and it certainly explains what happened. But I think. Uh, one of the things that, with respect, Mr. Atham, is that it, it misses, misses uh, how people who were affected can can sort of uh, respond or how they can, wh where they go. Uh, it, it would be useful if we could get the general manager just to give an explanation of, 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 of what, what it actually means to have uh, the notice of natural disaster declaration, which was a, attached to your your mayoral minute here and and does it detail that how money would be coming to Lithgow to to actually try and fix some of the some of the systemic problems that we have uh, in relation to it so I was wondering if it would be possible to get a, a comment from uh, the general manager uh, just prior to that council Leslie I requested off Rachel Nicola full um, list of the people that had been flooded, both private and business. I've been calling on a lot of them. They know the resilience number. They've been ringing council. The council staff downstairs have been extremely busy uh, replying to um, each one of them, trying to help them navigate a way through. But I'll let the general manager extend on that. Thank you. Um, uh, Mayor, yes, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Leslie. Um, it's my understanding that as a matter of course with sewer surcharges out of our licensing, we would um, standardly uh, report those, uh, publicly report them. And um, when the notice motion comes on, uh, perhaps we can deal with that issue more then. Um, but uh, as for the natural disaster declaration and uh, that uh, fundamentally, and we're really pleased with the turnaround time. These things have taken a bit longer in the past, but there's been a rapid approval of that declaration. And that declaration 
um, allows council but also business and uh, some residents um, to seek assistance from the government. In council's case, uh, we will need to bear the first $140,000 of costs, uh, but beyond that, uh, subject to um, all of the expenses uh, being proved through, proven through a robust financial auditing process, uh, we by and large can recover those costs. In the case of businesses, there's access um, to support services within Service New South Wales uh, and the like. I can't elaborate more on that. Uh, we can do that by way of a separate uh, memorandum. Um, and there's also um, a uh, direct assistance to residents uh, from a range of government agencies. Uh, we're very um, fortunate to have a quite exceptional uh, resilience officer in Rachel Nicholl within the organisation and she's doing some most wonderful work on behalf of Council. Already um, she is engaging, as Councillor Goodsell said, uh, with residents, compiling registers, uh, connecting people up uh, directly with the services. There's already, uh, since the flood event, been a review undertaken about just how smooth and efficient or or alternately cumbersome or clunky the response has been. And out of that, I've just received that today, but I'll be having a look at that to see if we can uh, have words to government uh, and even our local members to smooth up those, those processes. Uh, so, um, so fundamentally, I can elaborate or I can ask uh, Mr McGrath to elaborate over the next couple of days on exactly what it means. Um, but but what, what it really means is that government is stepping forward actively to work with council, with businesses and local residents. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, uh, through you, uh, Mr Atham, th thank you for that answer. I, I personally was aware that things were happening, but I felt that it was important that since it since the council meeting is being webcast, that we actually have it have it stated here in, in public and and for the for the record, just so that people do understand uh, that they can approach the council uh, if they if they're not if they're un uncertain about what's happening, they can approach the council that, and certainly they could approach uh, any and, and and ensure that uh, you know relief you know, and and financial assistance is available. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Leslie. We now come to the notices of motion. 9.1, notice sorry, of motion. Sorry. Oh, can I put the motion? Yeah, sorry. Put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, notice of motion, the 24th of the 1st, 2022. Councillor Marnie, support for mental health. Happy to second, Mayor Statham. Councillor Coleman. Councillor Marnie. Thank you. Um, Again, thank you for your mayoral minute, which has picked up on many of these uh, issues for our community, particularly around the first responders. Yeah, uh, as far as the mental health, still, I'm still talking to that, um, and they play a critical role in in bringing people into into health services. So I appreciate uh, how, how you've dealt with that, and I, I and thank you. Um, lifco has been in a unique situation in the last few years. We've had a sequence of natural stresses on our community, whether it's the bushfires and the floods, and and then now the subsequent significant flood. These have all impacted on people's well-being. Tie that in with the economic uncertainty and the changes to our our employment bases and so on. Um, we face some pretty challenging times, and then we place on top of that COVID. There's, we, we, we find ourselves in a position where our staff who deliver the health services, who take care for our people, are at a point where they're under significant pressure. To see the, the nurses of um, Westmead ICU actually go out in a uh, protest is a very rare thing to, to happen for nurses. I happen to be married to a nurse. I happen to be married to a mental health nurse. Um, and I have a, a, a circle of the mental health uh, nurses that are my friends. They're very uh, committed people. So for them to take that action, signaling to us as a community, there's a stress there. Um, the, the other element of it is that uh, I wanted as an incoming councillor to acknowledge the work of the previous council. I don't want to appear that I've appeared and I've suddenly discovered that mental health is an issue for our community. Um, I, I certainly want to acknowledge the, the work that the previous council did and I particularly want to acknowledge uh, Councillor Wayne McAndrew, who was, who was a very strong advocate for mental health 
improvements in our community and also Councillor Leslie, who chaired the Mental Health uh, Task Force for a period. Uh, what I'm also looking out of this is an opportunity for, as the Mayor again, to be able to, to make message to our community the importance and, that we place on the service they're providing, whether they're aged care workers, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, um, the people taking our, our blood tests in, in our GP clinics, um, and the kitchen staff and the wards people, they're all part of a critical uh, service that we have relied on very heavily during this period. Uh, the third part of the, the uh, motion is, I've been approached around psychiatrist services and in our community, they're uneven in their delivery. There's some areas that are that there is there is good delivery patterns. There's others, depending on your age group, but particularly for at-risk young people, um, it's a different service level for those people. They're navigating a period in their life where mental health can have significant impacts on their life then and, and ongoing in their life. And psychiatrists play a critical role in in their well-being. Um, I'm asking the council to, to um, endorse a representation by the mayor and the general manager to bring back advice on those that inconsistent application of that service. And also, my understanding is there's, there is no, or I've been told for low income earners, bulk billing is difficult to access. So people need to make decisions about their well-being and uh, whether they can pay for a service. So I'd just like to get some uh, response back to those concerns that have been raised with me through the community. And that's why I brought that, this particular motion so early in the council is to um, is that that situation sits out there as we stand. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mayor Statement. Uh, Lithgow City Council has been prominent in its support regarding mental health. And this notice of motion gives us the opportunity to continue on with advocating for mental health services. I congratulate Councillor Mani by bringing this forward. And the past couple of years have been challenging, as Councillor Mani said, drought, bush, bushfire, COVID, pandemic, the recent storms and floods. But we also um, need to remember the mouse plague as well that hit the Central West, not so much here in Lithgow, but a little bit further outwards. It is important that our community has access to psychiatric services and wait times need to be shortened. I just note in the management comment, Council has recently been successful in obtaining a disaster recovery community development worker for 12 months, commencing early 2022. I was hoping that we could get a little bit more detail, Mayor Statham, on that. Has the recruitment process began or has it already been finalised? It is mentioned in the management's comment under this particular notice of motion. So if we could get some further detail on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Coleman. Mr General Manager. Uh, Mayor, Mr McGrath can deal with that, uh, that inquiry. Councillor Statham. Um, yeah, I can report that we have commenced the uh, recruitment process for that temporary position. It's funded through the Nepean Blue Mountains um, Primary Health Network, the uh, RHN. And uh, in fact, we, we kicked it off today in terms of the recruitment process. So we're hoping to install that new worker as soon as possible. It, it, is, it has to be completed. That project needs to be completed by late December. Uh, so time is of the effort, essence. And it's envisaged that the position will complement um, the community recovery officer that we've already spoken about tonight and will be located in this building. Thank you, Mr McGrath. Uh, anybody wishing to speak against the motion? I'd like to speak up. Yeah, I, we're up to against the motion. Anybody wishing to speak against the motion? Anybody wishing to speak for the motion? Council Goodsell. Thank you, Mayor Statham. Thank you and congratulations, Mr uh, Councillor Marnie, for bringing this one to our attention again. I believe we must fight and scrap um, to keep our current level of health services and more importantly to advocate for more, which is what this is going to bring about. 
Um, in relation to, that's in relation to dot point one. In relation to top point two, I strongly agree our health workers need every single recognition, um, but I'm just going to add my two bobs worth that that shouldn't stand alone. Each and every individual in our community has risen to the occasion during COVID. Our emergency workers, our vulnerable families, our parents, our teachers, students, retail staff, food suppliers, and in particular our small businesses who have suffered and struggled significantly to keep their, their heads above water to maintain their services and really importantly our local employees. They're juggling income, trawling through COVID regulations, support grant applications month after month and this has had a, a significant impact on our whole community's mental health. Obviously our state and our nation services are strapped everywhere. I think our community workers across our entire local government area have enabled our health workers to do what they do so well. Um, in relation to dot point three, this is something I raised a, a, a paediatric report very early when I was a councillor and I left it at that and I shouldn't have. I should have followed it up and, and pursued it and hopefully I can team up with you, Councillor Marnie, and get some data, which I need. think we need the data to, to drive this further. Um, we need to, to know specifically, I think, how, how many residents, how long um, how long they're waiting um, for the government to stand up and listen. I think we need strong and consistent, persistent representations from the whole council. Um, and, and we need to keep doing it again and again and again. They'll give us a report back and it'll be it'll be fluffy and it'll be short, but um, we, ne we need to keep following up. So um, the paediatric services, that's the very start of our mental health journey. They're 11 to 12 weeks currently. If you're Indigenous, um, you, you get a foot in the door after 13 weeks, depending on your diagnosis, whether it's behavioural or, or medical. Behavioural gets shoved to the back of the list um, because it's not necessarily seen as an impact on a family and sometimes often it's the most um, significant impact. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. I hope that we get a good result back from the Minister um, and I'm happy to certainly work with you to, to gather data on these very important psychological, psychiatric and paediatric services in our community. Thank you, Councillor Goodsell. Is anybody else wishing to speak for the motion or I'll put the motion? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Against, unanimous. Thank you. 9.2, Councillor Marnie, Stormwater and Sewerage Management. Uh, do I need to wait for a seconder? Yes. Thank you, Councillor Goodsell. Okay. Thank you again, Councillor Goodsell. Um, okay. Uh, I particularly want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Higlett uh, for their, their, their presentations tonight. Um, you both have presented very disturbing personal experiences. Um, we all like to think our house is safe. Um, and from a health point of view, and, and that's certainly been impacted by the, the, the statements you made. So I appreciate that this is a difficult time for both of you. Um, I see this uh, issue as being there's three water services that exist in our area. Um, there's our drinking water, there's our wastewater, and then there's a third water service, which is our stormwater management. I think it's critical that they never interact particularly the, uh, the wastewater and drinking water. That's an obvious one to everyone. I know that the city of Young had problems with faecal coliforms in its drinking water supply at one stage. Um, however, what is, is concerning, and there was one representation that wasn't brought tonight, which was um, from a gentleman in Faro Avenue who's had a consistent problem over a long term with uh, sewer and stormwater entering his property. Um, I, a very similar story to these two gentlemen. Uh, when we do have stormwater integrating or infiltrating into our sewer, we then increase the volume of sewer that we need to manage and also our ability to keep it within that constrained system. Um, I accept that this was the, the recent storm event was a significant event and I, I want to talk away from that event because this uh, issue has been brought up for several months for me. Uh, the gentleman in Faro Avenue uh, first contacted me just before Christmas. And we had a 35 mil event on the 23rd of the 12th. And we subsequently had a 21 mil event on the 27th of the 12th. On both those occasions, 
sewer was discharged from that location into the person's property. Given he's living in a point where he's in the low point of the system, his bathroom has become the uh, pressure valve for those, those systems. So uh, that's backing up into his toilet and into his bathroom. Now we, we all understand the, the, uh, the seriousness of that as far as a, per, a, a, a personal health risk. Um, so I, I've seen it as an ongoing issue, not, not just, and I think Mr. Smith uh, allayed to that as well. Um, for me, I've, I appreciate this, the staff's report. Um, it it uh, gives some insight. There's two things that I see as, as positives, and that's the integrated, and I'll make sure I get these terms right, the integrated uh, wastewater, uh, thank you, and also the uh, flood risk mitigation planning. The work that's going on, I'm sitting as a community member on the flood risk mitigation planning, the work that's going on there gives me significant confidence about this, the, the helicopter planning. Um, I need to, I, I feel that we need to have a further investigation into the role that's, that stormwater infiltrating into sewage is playing. I understand that groundwater has been identified as a significant uh, player in the, in, in the process. However, I am unclear why we would have a surge, a hydraulic surge in the sewer, which lasts for the time of the storm and then cease afterwards. Uh, like Mr. Higlett, I've got a series of photographs and videos of all of those events uh, because of a personal interest in stormwater management. In my day job, I build structures that, that strip nutrients out of stormwater. So um, I've had a long-term interest in that. So another system similar to our smart meters um, through yeah, sewage management, we're able to detect early on chokes or where um, rises in manholes and the like happen. So we can actually be proactive and get to those issues prior to it discharging into properties and the like. So yeah, we do have a list of those areas that are problematic and we're working through those as part of a business plan or business case, I should say. Thank you, Mr. Trapp. You're right. Uh, Councillor Leslie. Uh, thank you, Mayor Statham. I, I don't wish to move an amendment, but I'd just like to ask uh, the first sentence in, of the recommendation, should this resolution be carried, a report be brought back to Council. I was just kind of asking and hoping perhaps it could come back via the Operations Committee uh, as a result that the Operations Committee being a far more informal body, there'd be a scope there for questions and answers and, and further questions and further answers and, you know, and, and get details that's, that's really not, not available at a, a formal meeting of the council such as this. But uh, I don't need to move, I just need to, um, to put it forward as a, as a suggestion and hope it's uh, agreed to. Um, Mayor, it would be the intention of the administration to bring it back to an information session, as well as the, the operations committee is a more focused group. But I think this, I'm picking up the vibe that this is a, a matter that um, that all of the councillors have an interest in. So the information session has all nine councillors there. Uh, it sounds like this but is a big strategic That would be issue. satisfactory. Mm. Thank you, Councillor Leslie, Mr. General Manager. May I state them, if I may? Yes, certainly, Councillor Coleman. I only have a question. Um, I don't want to add to the notice of motion. It's basically self-explanatory in the management report. I understand that. The last line, though, I do have a question on. It is timely with the new council for, for detail about the above to be brought to council. That's what I want to know. When is it going to be brought back? If it's stated in the management comment, it's timely. What is the KPI on that? How soon can we get this back? Clearly, this is affecting, you know, residents' lives. And if we get another rain event, which is likely considering how much rain we've had since November, when is it going to be done? Mr. General Manager, thank you. Oh, well, I'll, uh, if, if the notice of motion um, passes this evening, as I'm anticipating it will, I'll then convene uh, 
with uh, Mr. Edgecombe and Mr. Trapp and scope um, uh, the time required. Um, I, I actually expect that we'll have a couple of briefings, but that it will come as soon as possible. So I'd imagine um, probably not uh, February, but certainly uh, I think we'd be able to have a run over this at a March meeting, March information session. Any other people wishing to speak for or against this? Councillor Goodwin. Yeah, I had a couple of things written down, Mayor Statham. Uh, what I was concerned about was the uh, what immediate steps can be put in place to mitigate the sewage overflowing into people's residence. Um, this has been an ongoing problem for years and uh, only pops up when a flood event occurs. Uh, this happens in low-lying areas around the town, not only just in uh, the uh, extension estate area, but other areas. Um, once it happens, it's um, pretty quickly to my mind, forgotten about. Um, we need to be uh, identifying all the residents that channel storm water into sewage systems and have them uh, rectify this for, probably for a start. We need to allay the residents' concerns by giving them a solid commitment to the community and I'm sure that this will happen through the IWCM. So that's just a statement I've written down. Thank you, Councillor Goodwin. Anybody else wishing to speak? Right of reply, Mr. Councillor Marnie, or are you happy with the result? And I'll put the motion. Uh, just a brief comment. Uh, I, I thank, thank you, Councillor Goodwin. I, I, the mitigation action is is pretty important. If, as I said, there's been three events between the middle of December to now. Uh, this individual has a persistent problem. I'm not sure about other people down street, down sloping, Cupro, and so on. Uh, but if if I could ask that staff perhaps have, have bring some special attention to that particular section of assets and just inspect them and see if there's any way that we can mitigate some of the things that are happening at the moment or physically once it enters the surface stormwater flows, whether we can do something in the short term around the people's properties to stop it entering their property. Um, so if I could ask that and Yes, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Against? Uh, thank you. Excellent. Nine point three, Councillor Stuart McGee, control measures for excessive growth on roadsides. Mr McGee. Thank you, Mayor Statham. Um, Yes, this uh, notice of motion came out. Do I have a second, please? Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Mar Councillor Marnie. Yes, this notice of motion came about after a visit to uh, Glenn Davis and speaking to some of the residents down there. Uh, we had a bit of a public meeting and uh, yes, one of the primary concerns with the group that I was talking to in particular was the roadside vegetation, um, the height in particular and thickness of it. Uh, reports of kangaroos coming out, going straight under a vehicle and rolling the vehicle. Um, you can't see the, the safety markers on the side of the road in quite a few places. It's very thick down there. And it's primarily seems to be in the more outlying areas, the harder, the further out areas. Um, certainly around Portland, Sunny Corner Road, it's up on Garland's Hill there. Uh, vehicle rolled just on the weekend. Uh, yesterday on the halfway down Garlands Hill, there was a vehicle on its roof. Welsh has smashed pulling it out. Um, the safety markers are very difficult to see along many parts of Sunny Corner Road and even Piper's Flat Road, all of the roads out that way. But certainly as you get further out and, and particularly Glen Davis, Glen Ellis, it's such a long way to take our vehicles like a, a tractor. Um, you know, they, they don't have suspension. To take a tractor that far, it's pretty much, you know, I've driven tractors. You've done a day's work by the time you've driven a tractor from Willerwang or Lithgow to Glen Davis. That's a long way to drive a vehicle like that. The only suspension they have is in the seat. Um, and let alone what that does to machinery, you know, like especially a side cutting um, slasher, you know, it's, it's hanging off the side of a tractor on four point linkage and with no suspension, that's a lot of wear and tear on that equipment, let alone the tractor itself. 
Um, I don't see it as a frivolous thing or um, an, even an aesthetic thing to be mowing the sides of the roads in Australian countryside. As I see it as very much a compulsory exercise, um, especially when we're trying to attract people from as tourists to the area. Um, we've been very fortunate with the amount of rain. Like, yes, it is to blame partly for the excessive growth at this stage, but it's also kept it green. But it, it is summer in Australia right now. And if we get a week of hot weather and wind and no rain, that'll be dry as a chip in a week. Now, if some of these tourists that we're attractive, attracting with our seven valleys, you know, it's a, it's a lovely slogan. It's, it's going to work. And you will get people coming out and they're going to go, Capity Valley, let's go and have a look. And it's a beautiful valley. But when one of those people breaks down and has to pull off to the side of the road, which is becoming smaller and smaller, as Bruce Richardson pointed out, the grass is literally encroaching onto the road and literally consuming the road by getting the roots underneath and causing, and once it cracks and then a seedling, you can see how it all starts. But essentially the grass is encroaching onto the bitumen and breaking the bitumen and so reducing the actual width of the road literally um, but these people they, they're if they break down they're going to pull off into that grass there's nowhere else to go and if it's dry then lord help us and them so i see it as very much a safety factor especially when you're attracting tourists to the area who are not familiar with the dangers of red hot exhaust on dry grass um, and particularly with the local knowledge so if it's this is not really aimed at around Lithgow or these easy to reach areas where you know where we're already here it's for those further out areas where people with local knowledge local machinery can be instructed or put in for a tender or put in a quote on their rate and a quote for, you know, that management can say, okay, for argument's sake, from Glen Davis to Glen Ellis or in the Rydal area or any of the valleys that we we are currently struggling to get to. I think that if we can have local people doing those and or available to do those on call, going into, especially next spring, if we can have this in, enabled by next spring, then, that will enable us to reduce the volume of fire risk on the sides of the roads, for one, and uh, just reduce the wear and tear on our tractor, tractors. You know, like hopefully we have a, a few of them, but uh, you know, driving a tractor to those outlying areas, as I said, like over operated machinery and. As tractors are not fun and they're very difficult to operate at the best of times. So to have to drive one to Glen Davis and then concentrate on not taking out road markers, then I wouldn't like to do that. It's going to be a hard job. And then you've got to drive that tractor all the way home. And after our induction on Saturday, I also had another idea that perhaps we could build a bit of rapport, like for areas where that where the tender process didn't go through or was not successful with any local contractors, that we build up a rapport with the SF, SES and RFS. And if we do take a tractor all that way out to say Glen Davis once again, um, or wherever it may be, that we have rapport enough with those um, centres like the SES and RFS in that area that we could store that tractor there overnight or for a couple of nights, if that's how long it took, um, instead of having to bring it all the way home. Something along those lines. Um, Would yeah. you like an extension, Councillor McGee? Because no, I think I could save the rest for a rotary. Thank you. Uh, anyone against the motion? Councillor. Oh, actually, I'll... Uh, seconder. Yes. Councillor Marnie. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, look, I won't, I won't cover the same territory that Councillor McGee's covered. Um, I obviously, like a lot of people, and I'm sure the council staff are getting representation from people in some of the, the rural roads and rural communities. Um, I'll just do it a few nuts and bolts. I, un 
I'd, I'd note the management comment and uh, that uh, proposal to bring a report back. I think that's good. I think we need to have visibility over over the costs of, the, of these uh, proposals. Um, whether we look at the establishment of a contractor panel, which might be used during peak periods, um, that may be part of it. Um, I'll let the staff uh, work through that. I do note, and, and it's something I was conscious of at the time, that um, we need to keep in mind that in, in May 2011, the council was fined $130,000 for roadside vegetation management, which uh, impacted on a, a protected uh, system that was covered under the Threatened Species Act. So we need to have a, a well-developed uh, scope if we are going to engage external people. Could I also ask, just if, if the movers is okay with this that also um, could we just get a report back uh, from the staff if there's if there's plant issues like is it an issue that we've got a singular uh, piece of plant that we need to have on the road almost continuously from August to February and our staffing um, structures during uh, strategies during those growing seasons um, so I'm, I'm happy to have somebody come back from the staff and uh, and advise us on the uh, feasibility of this proposal. Is there anyone speaking? Thank you, Councillor Marnie. Is there anybody speaking against this? I'd I'd like to make an amendment if I can. Yes, I had a. I do. I just have to say what my amendment is yes, first. Thank then you. do I speak to it, or you'll need a second to thank you, but speak to it first. Uh, um, sorry, tell me what your amendment it's, is. It's first. just very, very broad. Um, it's non-specific. We need to know um, the the areas that are going to be considered. And obviously we need a report back first on what that's going to cost. So uh, that the areas be made specific and a report be brought back to council because we can't just go willy-nilly saying we're going to slash um, and engage a, a contractor. Um, anyway, that, that's my amendment. I'll second that. You'll second that, Councillor Goodwin. Thank you. So I wasn't – areas be made specific and a report be – The areas I can now say Councillor McGee didn't mention, but they were specifically for Cavity Valley. I understand, um, them, but they Walgan need to be in the report. And they need to be in the report. Like yes. it needs to be in the recommendation. Yes. Can we, um, sorry, Mayor Statham, can we get something on the screen? Because it's not working on my screen, the amendment. Can we see that? Is that possible? Can I ask a question? Yes. Excuse me, Councillor McGee, would you have an issue with um, amending your your notice of motion and adding in to, to it the specific areas where you thought needed to be designated to tender? Sorry, Mayor Statham. Uh, no, I left it deliberately broad because it's for the areas which would come back in the report from our executive that we are having difficulty reaching. And they would also know which were the more outlying areas which would be applicable to this tender process. Like, so it would be the, the more outlying areas where they know that it takes half a day to, for that tractor to get there. Where they're wasting, where we're where we're wasting a lot of time just with that tractor driving down the road, not cutting a blade of grass. But I, I certainly couldn't name those areas. I wouldn't like to try, you know, and be specific. I think it should be open to a fair degree to the um, the operations area as to where those areas that they are finding hardest to get to where we should open the tenders to. So the areas around here that we are managing, that they feel comfortable managing. So it's very much an operational thing, which would be the specific part of this. So that's why I left it so broad, because I wouldn't like to restrict it 
or um, or have it too restricted. Because if it's if, when it's broad, the operations can come back and say in their report that we haven't got to Glen Davis for two years, or you know because it's so far, and we haven't been to up near Oberon for two years because we it's too far, or whatever it may be, you know. So, yeah. Mayor Statham, if I could be point of order, we've got an amendment. I don't yeah. mean to be rude, Sorry. but yeah. we need to stick to procedure. Um, we've got an amendment up, which Councillor Goodsell has the opportunity to speak to. So, could we right. do that, please? Yeah. Would you like to speak to your amendment, please? Oh, um, I just raised this because if, if the recommendation as it currently stood could open up a, a great big can of worms, we, we don't have resources, we don't have... Um, funds. We don't have, while I hear um, what the Richardsons were saying tonight, I didn't realise that this notice of motion was specific to their to their area. Um, these things have to be done properly. If we're going to allocate funds from um, somewhere to somewhere else, we need to do it transparently. We need to consider the whole local government area. We need to consider 21,000 people's ratepayers' money. Um, if there's, I need to know if there's a safety concern. Has it been assessed? Um, I'd, I'd like to know from uh, um, Mr Edgecombe that, that uh, roadside vegetation actually holds the road together. We've just, we've, is our council financially sustainable to be able to manage, um, you know, events like this where we're just saying we're going to open up a contract for tenders for local contractors? It's, it, can, it can cost $10,000, it can cost $200,000. I need to know exactly um where it is and and a report to say where the money's coming from and what we're going to miss out on and if there's a safety concern. Yes. Yeah, I'd also like to speak Council to Goodwin. The, I'd also like to speak to the amendment. Um, I, I totally agree with what uh, Councillor Goodsell has just said. But uh, looking through the mowing schedule, um, just for Glen Ellis, um, we, we won't need to use tractors down there. It says that we only need to use mowers and it'll only take one day to uh, do Glen Ellis. That's on the council mowing schedule. Um, Sorry, just through you, Mayor Statham, just a point of clarification there. Yeah. With that mowing schedule, refers specifically to open space and parks, not roadsides. Right. Um, yeah, so that's that's something that I'm glad was clarified. But uh, I totally agree with what uh, Councillor Goodsell saying. We need to know exactly what's coming back. What's it going? What's it going to cost the council um, to do all of this and the and all of the safety concerns? Right. I'll put the amendment then. I, I'd like to speak, Mayor Statham, if I may, in regards to the amendment, please. Yeah. Um, Councillor McGee, I actually agree that roadside vegetation needs to be slashed. There is clearly a need there. We all agree on that. The issue I have is the fact of the employment of a contractor. That's the issue I have. And the fact that we do need further information on what areas need to be slashed and there's a cost involved. I'm wondering if, Mayor Statham, if one of the staff could answer this question. Instead of a contractor, is there an opportunity for overtime to have the situation, the roadside vegetation slashed so that we're looking at that? Is that more economical? Is that an option? Could we go down that path? I mean, I agree that we need to have more information on where it needs to be specified. We also need a cost analyst. We need to understand what we're going to get bang for buck. So can I have that question answered, please? Uh, Mr. Go Mr. Mr. Edgecombe? Uh, through you, Mayor Statham, I, I, I do believe that I need to give a measured response to this. I think that uh, in order to give you the information you need to make an informed decision, I need to present all the facts to the council, including the budget that we have this year, how many positions that supports, uh, the, the equipment that's used, what issues that may or may not have. So I'm taking note of the questions raised here and I do believe that it would be valuable to present a report to the council answering all of these. Thank you, um, Mayor Statham. Thank you, Mr. Hedgeham. Um, Councillor, if you wouldn't mind, 
in regards to your amendment. Can I add to it? Can we add a costing factor Absolutely. to your amendment? Yep. So can I see the amendment, please? Yeah. And Councillor Bryce would like to speak. Councillor like, Bryce, can we... Uh, just yep. regards to the amendment, that the report be brought back to Council, which includes the areas to be specified and a cost analysis. Could you... Are you happy to add that? Coleman, uh, Councillor Bryce. All right, so I'm speaking for the amendment as well as the motion in the fact that I believe that using contractors is a cheaper alternative than using putting on extra staff or using staff that have got other jobs to do to do this job because obviously they're not getting to it now and they're not going to get to it in the future. By using contractors and their equipment, it, it, uh, it releases our equipment and the council's equipment, council workers to work on other jobs that need to be done around the towns and the villages. Um, it, I think it will be a cheaper alternative than a $130,000 fine that we received, as, Mr., uh, as Councillor Marnie had mentioned. That was impacted on us and still the work was not done. So having and doing overtime is a huge cost to any business and we would have to put on a fair bit of overtime to try and catch up to the work down at Glen Davis, what I've seen. I drove in from Ralston to Glen Alice recently and, uh, and through there the weeds are terribly across the road and quite high, making it very hard. I've never driven that road. That was my first trip. And it made, it made me very um, wary of driving on that road. If we're trying to um, get tourists who have never driven on that road, the whole thing is quite dangerous. It also, also brings down uh, animals on the road and all sorts of other issues with that. But using contractors for seasonal work makes a lot more sense business-wise. Thank you. Councillor Leslie. Uh, thank you, Mayor Statham. Actually, I like the motion. It, uh, it, and I congratulate Councillor McGee for bringing it to us. I mean, this, the weeds are along the sides of the roads, it, it really is a, an enormous hazard to, to people and it's, it's unsightly as well. And it, uh, now that the, the, the Capity Valley has been uh, sealed from right through with the Glen Alice Road and Glen Davis Road sealed right through, that that will attract a lot more people to come through. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a great drive and, it, and we need to support it. But I'd like to also throw in just a, another thought that uh, we forget just how big Lithgow Council is and, and, and this, the areas that it encompasses. Uh, we go as far as Bogey. It's, what is it, 30 kilometres, 40 kilometres? It's, it's a long way and, and it's, it's exactly right. It's, in, it's, it's extremely difficult to get a tractor out there to do it if you're starting from, say, well, Arrawang. We also encompass the Megalong, Megalong Valley. Now, there's no reason to believe that the, I haven't been down on the Megalong Valley for, for a year and a half or so, when we went to the, the site inspection down there, but there's no reason to believe they haven't got the same weed drop problem along their roads. So what is the, what's the thought that we could actually ask uh, Midwestern Council and, and Blue Mountain City Council? You know, now, obviously it was, Bogey was once was part of the Ralston Shire Council. Now, they clearly have to do their weed uh, in slashing on their roads. Maybe maybe it's possible just to to ask. We, we'd ha obviously have to pay them, uh, but we're paying someone. Uh, so both, you know, whether approaches could be made to Midwestern Council and, and uh, Blue Mountains Council just to to consider, you know, at a cost, you know, doing doing our little bit of roads there. You know, perhaps perhaps down as far as Glen Alice, and, and that's uh, that's. Uh, I'm not. I'm not moving it as a motion. I'm just really putting that forward as perhaps uh, an, in, an investigation or a suggestion to come through. But it, it's great that this this issue has now come forward. It's great that we're, we're discussing it. It's great that we're we're talking about you know ways to to uh, mitigate the problems. And, and Councillor McGee is completely right. Uh, give us three weeks of, of, I wish it had happened, give us three weeks of, of, of sunny summer weather and, 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 that, and those, uh, that, those roadsides then really do become uh, something that we would 
you know, might might fear to, to drive through. So, Mr General Ranidji, would you like to comment on that? Thank you. Uh, not specifically on Councillor Leslie's comment, but I do just want to seek an important clarification because the, the amendment and the original have mm. uh, an important distinction and I, I just want to, to explore what is the, uh, what the difference because we do need a clarification. Um, the amendment has the effect of requesting a report back covering all, all of the facts and, and arguments uh, for and against um, an alternative model of delivery. Um, a literal reading of the original recommendation um, is that we move straight to um, uh, opening up a tender uh, for this process. So, um, you know, from the administration's perspective, irrespective of which part is my strong recommendation, and it will be my my uh, suggestion that we bring back a, a report um, outlining uh, the facts. So, I'm 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 just tabling that. Um, so to save all the confusion, would would uh, Councillor Goodsell, Councillor McGee, and Councillor Goodwin, would you be happy for the general manager to bring back a report? Yes, I would realise that, but I'm just saying, would you be happy to bring back a report? Yes, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour of the amendment? Now becomes the motion, so um, Councillor Goodsell. All right, anybody wishing to speak? No, just. All right, I'll put the motion. All those in favour of the motion? Against? Carried. We have point 9.4 now the nomination, sorry, the notice of motion from Councillor. Yes, I'm just saying that now. Councillor Col O'Connor, uh, Council Land, Councillor O'Connor, when you're ready. Thank you, Mayor Statham. Uh, my recommendation, my commentary is about uh, the land that's owned by Litco Council, that it should be land banked for future development of the area. That's my I'm happy to second that for the purpose of debate, Mayor Statham. Thank you, Councillor Holman. Councillor Connor, would you like to expand a little on that for us, please? Uh, my recommendation is that no land owned by Litco Council is to be negotiated or sold to any third party prior to a meeting of Council for debate and discussion. And number two, if it is decided at a council meeting that the land should be sold, two valuations must be completed to determine a reserve price, and then it's got to be sold by public auction. That's, thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Connor. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor McGee? Sorry. Oh, sorry, Councillor I already can. can. Yes, second yes. it, Mayor State. You had before he read that out, so sorry. Um, Councillor Coleman. Um, no, I reserve my right. I think I'd like to listen to the debate, so I'll sit back. Right. Anybody watch. against this? Oh, yes, actually. Yep. Councillor Goodsell? Um, yeah, I, I am against it, and because I probably haven't got enough commentary from um, Councillor O'Connor in regard to what this is specifically referring to. I know that council owns a lot of land. It owns operational land. It owns community land. I don't believe we can bank community land, which is our parks and gardens, etc. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr Muir. We did receive an, an email of Mr Muir today outlining the process for council land. Um, and as far as I'm aware, it has to come before council for a decision anyway. Also, in regard to the, um, oh, I'm happy with the valuations. I don't know, can't remember exactly how that was worded in uh, our email today, but we had a situation recently at the end of last year where we were presented with a parcel of land and actually I was the one that insisted on moving that <coughs> to public auction and thankfully um, council staff jumped on that. It wasn't a parcel of land that council owned that was that was, um, it wasn't able to be, it wouldn't have been productive for us to go through that process for public auction and it was instead sold to to a, 
a, a neighbouring property that it was really valuable to. So I don't believe that we can um, sell all our land when it does come to council by pu by um, public auction. It needs to be negotiated between the councillors and, and, and agreed on and and um, and gone from there. So it, I would like some insight into what um, uh, Councillor O'Connor is is meaning with his with his um, notice of motion today. Uh, Councillor O'Connor will get to do a right of reply. Anybody now for the motion, please? Yes. Councillor McGee? Um, I'd like to speak for this. Um, the response from Mr Muir is, is broad and there are exceptions. This is no exceptions. Just for the meantime, until we get on top of our finances, until we find out exactly where we're tracking, so that we can have a full view and evaluation of exactly what we do and do not have. Um, it just freezes everything just for the moment. Just this is this is just so we can work out what we've got and let's have a look at it and go from there. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Anybody well, wishing to speak for it? I've got a question, I'm sorry, yeah, just in Councillor Goodwin? I'd like to make um, with the, uh, accept uh, with Cole's accept uh, Councillor O'Connor's accept, uh, acceptance a couple of um, amendments, if possible. Um, add add a point three and a point four. A point four is that the full report of any operational and community land owned by council be made available to councillors. And then a point for decisions of a minor nature under, say, I would say $50,000 be brought to the operations meeting for a determination rather than a council meeting. Uh, unfortunately, we can't accept point with the operations, Councillor Goodwin. Uh, the committee cannot do that. Okay. Oh, I'll just add the point, um, point three. Councillor O'Connor, would you be happy to, to um, add point three to your recommendations? Would you like them to repeat what point three was? Could you repeat that again, thanks? Now that a full report of operational and community land that's owned by Lithgow Council made available to the councillors. Yes, that would be good. Th Thank you, Councillor O'Connor and Councillor Goodwin. Anybody else wishing to speak for the motion? Um, I'm the seconder, um, Councillor Statham, and I need to accept that amendment as well, and I yes. do. Yes. <laughs> but I'd like, I'd like some clarification. Could you please go into further detail, Councillor Goodwin, on regards to, you know, what it is that you want exactly from that? So my understanding is Council has uh, operational land and community land. Uh, operational land is... is Land that council, um, that, that council are able to do what they they need to do with the land oper for operational reasons, whereas community land, um, it really has to be brought to a council meeting. Uh, I want to know how much land that we have operationally and how much land we have um, as community land that uh, we can look at some land. As, as, it could be um, community land or it could be operational that we we haven't used for a very long time. And uh, if, it, if it's brought to council, we may be able to um, work out whether we do need to uh, move this land on or do something with the land rather than just let it sit there for years and years and years. We need to be looking at everything. Um, yeah, so that's, that's why I wanted a report um, to be brought to council. And I understand like small parcels of land and uh, say, for instance, it's what happened at, uh, at the Workmen's Club. Um, there was a small, very small parcel of land that over time uh, ended up on the, the Workmen's Club site. It, was, it would, would have only been, you know, a, a, a small you know, 30 or 40 metres worth of land. Um, that I don't think that really needs to come to a council meeting for a council to negotiate uh, the sale of that land to the club. Thank 
Councillor Coleman, have you accepted that amendment? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Goodsell, would you like um, write a reply to your amendment? Uh, Councillor Marnie? Um, I, I think Councillor Goodsell explained it fairly well with the community lands. We're talking about parks, generally recreational community facilities. They, they sit under the Local Government Act over here. We need to re rezone them if we want to bring them in for sale. So I think banking those, I think, isn't necessary. I, I think I understand where Councillor O'Connor is coming from, where he wants to see best value returns on lands that Council disposes of, and I support that process. Um, my only concern is that in the in that we're clear that we're talking about operational land, and also that we're clear that we've assessed those. And I, I thank Councillor Goodwin for his suggestion about the the list and actually having a full understanding of our complete assets. Um, however, we keep in mind that we've got an operational land in Petra Avenue in Clarence, which was the site of the former uh, community building. Um, I wouldn't want to see that get banked into a a lot that would see that disposed of. I'm also um, I'm not comfortable with the notion that, uh, and I understand what you've you've stated on committees deciding on disposal of land. I I I'm. I know that that land was subject to possible negotiations of disposal, perhaps to adjoining landholders. But I, I think we've got to be very, um, very clear what lands are going into that operational bank. Um, so that's the only concern I've got. I think there's a lot of detail stuff, and I may be one of the people uh, going to this in this meeting tonight. I think this would benefit from a briefing for the councillors. Um, so we understand the, the the spread of assets we've got. Um, so we, I'll, well, I'm happy to move an amendment if that, I'm sorry, Councillor Connor, this seems to be going around in a, a, a pathway, but um, that I think that we, we as councillors need a briefing in regard to our property portfolio and, and particularly our operational lands and and not, not, noting that many of them are used for depots and other activities. So uh, would the mover be happy yeah. to accept that amendment, I, I suppose? Oh, yes. I'm not talking about depots or anything like that. Yeah. I'm specifically talking about subdividable land that somebody can come in and make an offer and walk out with it when it's a rate payers when the council is supposed to be in the dire straits we're in, should get every penny for that can be possibly got. I've only got one motion on the amendment. Yes. Can I, can I speak? Beck, if, oh, sorry. So I'll, I'll just speak against the entire motion and, and hope that in Duke, if it if it if it loses, well, well, that's good. If it doesn't, I'll, at least I have on the record that you know we've just uh, we've just over egged the pudding and we don't know where we're going. I'm going to put the motion. Um, councils are only supposed to speak once, and right of reply is um, naturally would not be occurring at the moment. Um, it looks like oh, that. Sorry, I'm um, sorry, and I know I've only spoken once, but clearly we. Point of order, Council Goodsell. <sighs> yeah. Go on. We need to replace all of what's been done with Councillor Marnie's recommendation that a report be brought back full stop. I don't know how to do that to get to that point. But I think it's. Everyone wants. I'll have to move an amendment. Report back to council on our property portfolio. Thank you, Councillor Leslie. So I'll ending on that council. No, right. So I'll put that amendment. Now the amendment becomes a motion. So the amendment now becomes the motion. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour of the motion. Unanimous. Thank you.
Um, item number 10.1, general manager's reports. Yes, thank you. Happy to move that, uh, Mayor Statham. And I'd also like to nominate Councillor Leslie, if he would like to go, and if no one else would like to go. I'd also like to nominate Councillor O'Connor as well. Um, sorry, we can only take one unless we're going to put it to a vote. All right, Councillor O'Connor, definitely. Uh, anybody else wishing to nominate? Uh, um, can I just ask a question, Councillor Statham? I think back in the day when we had to nominate somebody in the previous council for this, I was... My name was ...put forward as attending. Is that correct? Um, yeah, because the, the conference was split into two sections. One was online um, back before the council, uh, new council was elected, and the second part of it was to this conference, but I'd like to withdraw and oh. let the other people go. <laughs> So at the moment, we have two, one person attend. So open vote, easier way to do this. I'm sorry, this is it. Okay, sorry. The New South Wales Special Conference Delegate. What are we voting on? Here, I think Council no Councillor Goodman uh, just um, got mixed up. With another one that's in, I think, the uh, agenda. Right. So at this point in time, we need one councillor to go to the conference, and Councillor Coleman has suggested Councillor Leslie. Would you accept that, Councillor Leslie? Is there anyone else who would like to attend? Congratulations, Councillor Leslie. Okay. I don't need to put it to a vote. You'll be going to the conference. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor. You do need to put the resolution. So I, again, carried unanimously. A late item tonight from the General Manager. It's a report on the delegate for the Upper Macquarie County Council. It's prepared by the General Manager, Mr Craig Butler. Thank you, Mayor. Macquarie Council has members uh, and linked to... Uh, delegates or members on that council representing the council. Um, we're required to hold an election. It's different. It's, it's governed by the regulation. It needs to be conducted in the regulation. And we're required to use a preferential system. Uh, unfortunately, because Councillor Bryce isn't in the room, she's not able to participate uh, in the election. And I've been, I've been briefed. Uh, I don't have an expertise in this regard, but uh, it came from a very seasoned general manager. I regret that. Um, nomination forms have been circulated, and I can advise the council um, that I have uh, three nomination or nominations for three councils. Nominations for three councils have been appropriately completed. Those nominations are for Councillor O'Connor, Councillor Leslie, and Councillor Arnie. Um, that therefore requires, because there are three candidates for two positions, um, we therefore need to, to, to hold. Carol, first one out will appear first on the paper, second, second. And he's going to help us. Uh, Arnie. Brightness, please. Next one, Mr. Gurney. 
Number two on the ballot paper will be Councillor Leslie and therefore Councillor O'Connor will appear third on the ballot paper. So we'll just write those ballot papers up and distribute those. And you're required to then indicate your preferences by way of your first preference having the number one against it. And you need to indicate number two and number three. And please be careful with that because we want all um, ballots to be legitimate or can eligible. You, can you please repeat that who's one, two and three? It'll appear on the ballot paper. Councillor Marnie, Councillor Leslie, Councillor O'Connor. O'Connor, sorry. Please have some silence, please, in respect for these candidates. Thank you. Mr Muir, can you um, circulate around and collect the completed papers, please? Could have been simple, could it? Hmm? Could have been simple. I hope it's not my deciding vote, that's all I can say, but it will be. Our councillors will just take a moment to work through those and what we're looking for is a ma absolute majority um, out of first preferences if possible, would be nice and that I, from my understanding would mean that person would go through. You count for the school, please. So the majority we have four. So we don't have a so the majority. Right, meaning. So that Who's result that didn't point? achieve an absolute majority. You sure? Just, just one moment, please. Do we double check this? Thank you. So let's just do it properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, out. Mahoney. Just check this, please. I don't need Leslie's. Here, there's another Leslie. Where is it? Leslie is two. O'Connor one. Right, that's that one done. Make sure we get them all. Two for Mahoney. One for Leslie. Uh, three for O'Connor. Because you got interruptions. Actually, it's a very second counter-casting. Like it's a very important thing, so I know what it feels like to have this. There's no absolute majority, mean an absolute majority meaning um, more than half of the, the vote, so that would have to be a vote of five. You then go to a second count, and what you do is the candidate with the least first preferences is, is excluded. At this point, we don't have an absolute majority, I am told. I don't know that. I don't know that yet. Well, no, the absolute majority is determined by a person with the most first preferences. I'm looking at people that know a lot more about these matters than myself. So we have no... I will let the finance man add my figures up. But we're looking... We're looking for... People with first preferences, if there's any absolute majorities, if there's no absolute majorities, i.e. none of the three councils have five ones against their name, well then 
from my understanding, it gets inverted and you exclude the person with the least first preferences. So who has the least first pre So we have no one with five ones. Mr. Gurney? Who does? Councillor Leslie has the lowest number of first preferences. And Councillor Leslie has the lowest number of first preferences. So it is my interpretation from that. Sixteen, well, I think. Yes. Well, but well. hmm. But you become excluded, don't you? Yes. Hmm. 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 Can I just get advice on that? If, if um, okay. so Council Leslie excluded, can someone clarify for me the process from there? Two ones each. Two ones. So we have no one with the with an absolute majority of first preferences, and we have the scenario where the other two candidates can be able. Least number of ones. Or we have the situation where two two councils have the same vote, the same number. Four two two. Oh well, that's got to pull one of those names out of the hat, and that person is the loser at this stage. Okay. Does the council accept that? So those two names go into the hat, and we pull one of those out. So that person who you put, then number two, and then counted, and then he gets the votes. Mm -hmm. Is she on the tree image? No, it's not. I'm <laughs> not looking. So the name that I've drawn is Councillor Leslie. Find the people who voted for Councillor Leslie first. Number one. Yes. 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 They go to the same person. So then we have a, another tie. But we're electing. Yes, so then they go on Councillor and Councillor O'Connor. Yes, we've got 4-4. Four, four. Councillor Les has got the mass here. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. But we want two you candidates. This time that person is the winner. They go through. He's elected as the first bill. Right, okay. With the two names. This time the person who comes out is elected. 
Yes, it must be. So I'm going to draw one of the two names and this time the person that is drawn is elected as a member. And that person is Councillor O'Connor. Congratulations to Councillor O'Connor. And now? Yes. Councillor O'Connor, congratulations. This is terribly interesting for me after one of my mayoral elections being pulled out of a hat. Go around again. Thank you, Mayor Sheedham. Yes. <laughs> I think he's declaring an interest. <laughs> Are you watching this, Councillor Bryce? <laughs> totally confused. So, um, Mr Gurney has advised me um, that with the flow of those preferences, we now have an absolute majority um, and, or, and therefore um, that person is elected to the second place and that is uh, Councillor Leslie. Congratulations, Councillor Leslie. It's quite interesting. Can I... No that might have appeared clunky and it was, but I thought, I actually thought... I wasn't thinking in the audience of the public. <laughs> what I was thinking about was the spirit and the way that that was. I thought that was very good. Great that, teamwork. That really, well done. We, we found our way through that without any harm or animosity. So I thought that was a great outcome. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Leslie, for Thank your you for knowledge on that Omani. particular item. And Councillor Omani, it's probably best if you didn't go. It sounds terribly confusing. Next time. I'm happy to provide any support to the two Good, councillors. That's um, I come from 32 years in weed management, but I'm happy to answer any question any day of the week if they want to post them. But right, we'll certainly get back now to some real business. Um, Madam Mayor, we need to put that. Do we need to put yes, that? Yes, I'll put that motion. Thank you. All those in favour, say so aye. Uh, a mover, please. That. Councillor Coleman, a seconder, please. Councillor Goodwin. Yes, so congratulations to Councillor Cole O'Connor and Councillor Stephen Leslie for the Upper Macquarie Weeds Council. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, just um, for housekeeping purposes, I need to remind the councillors that unless you're speaking, we should have our masks on. I'm, I'm sorry, just need to do that. No, you're right, you're speaking mm. um, to economic development. 10.2 Economic Development and Environment Reports. Councillor um, Ms. Statham, I'd like to move it, but with a second point, please. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. And what was your second point? Well, the first point reads, I'm just, uh, hang on, sorry. Okay, so the second, the first point reads that the council note the update on the appeal to the land environment court of the refusal of the development application for Bell Quarry Waste Management Facility. I'm happy to leave that, but I would like a second point and uh, I'll send it in an email if you like so that it if that helps, or I'll read it out. The second point is that council oppose the amended de, 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 DA, sorry, for the Bell Quarry Waste Management Facility. Excuse me, read that again. 
out again, Councillor Coleman. That council opposes the amended development application for the Bell Quarry Waste Management Facility. I just feel that the current recommendation isn't strong enough. Uh, the general manager would like to speak to that, Councillor Coleman. I'd seek, uh, yeah, I'd seek the counsel of uh, Mr Muir, but that uh, amendment may in fact be ultra vires because uh, council can't preempt a position it will take on an amendment. It's my understanding the amendment's still being assessed and it'll be reported. The amendment, to sorry, the report? Yeah, the, the amendment to the development application. Oh, okay. And I think your your uh, your proposed motion is looking to preempt the council's... That council opposed the amended, amended development application, yeah. So it requires the application to come to the council. So this isn't the application? No. This is merely an update. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I'll withdraw that number two then, if that's the case. And I'm happy to second the original motion. Thank you, Councillor Goodsell. Councillor Common, would you like to speak to that? Uh, yes. Um, look, I'll just briefly, because I, you know, I understand that we can't, I can't do a number two. But however, look, it has been a long-standing position of Lithgow City Council to oppose the importation of Sydney waste to Lithgow local government area. Uh, Lithgow is so much better than this. So I'm very interested to watch what happens in the land environment court. We need to provide as much support to those in regards to this. So I'll be watching this with great interest. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Councillor Goodsell. Thank you, Mayor Statham. Um, thank you for the staff for this update. It seems there is some positive amendments um, to this proposed development. One of them, which is really important, that um, any damage to any of our infrastructure is falls back on the developer. Um, I had a couple of questions with the reduction of the amount of fill. What would be the reduction of truck movements? I'm not sure if anyone can answer that at the moment. Um, what is the current position of Blue Mountain City Council and that was probably it. Um, and what possibly are the financial implications for us into the future? And this is one I'm really strong about. We have policy and we have word of mouth or something that's historical that's just said out loud um, whenever we get a development application. And that is, whilst I am opposed to um, transporting Sydney waste into our local government, we do not have a policy on it. And I would like it removed from, from this one and any future reference because policy implication to me, to me is something that we have adopted as a council and we have no formal adoption of, of a policy implication. Um, it just gives a representation that we do have this position and although I don't agree with waste, I don't agree with the policy implication being in there when it's not actually a policy unless we move to make a policy. Thank you, Council Goodsell. Anybody else wishes to speak, to speak against this? All four, would you like me to put the motion? Uh, Councillor Marnie? Just briefly, um, I'm noting in the uh, report, and I again, like uh, Council Goodall, thank uh, Andrew Muir's staff uh, for the prompt delivery of this. Um, I'm noting the materials that are proposed to be brought to LIFCO, uh, Venom Enum, which are all certified uh, materials, and then we have an, another clean fill material. This concerns me. I, I've got no certification indication with that. Uh, many a person has fallen uh, into, into dire situations where they've got clean fill from a building site, which then turns out to have some other issue with it. That's a point of concern. The other uh, question, I, I, if I could, through yourself, the Mayor, uh, to perhaps uh, through the general manager. I'm, I'm noting the inclusion of an en engineered barrier liner in the base and sidewall and caps to create a barrier to groundwater flow and infiltration of rainfall surface water into the in-place material. I would normally have expected that as part of a waste management facility structure. I'm unclear why uh, virgin excavated material or, or excavated material that's certified would need to have protection from groundwater infiltration. Um, I would normally have expected that to be linked to uh, more sort of toxic groundwater issues associated with leachate um, from from waste facilities. If, if I could get some clarification on that, please. Sure. 
I'll call on Mr Mule, please. Thank you. Yes, sir. I guess the only answer I can give is that was the uh, amendment put forward by the proponent. Um, there certainly was, in terms of the refusal, refusal of the original application, uh, a number of concerns expressed by the EPA, um, which was through another government department, and primarily the, the uh, issues of uh, um, groundwater from the development um, gaining access to the other groundwater net, the, other, the, the wider groundwater network. And I guess this was seen by the applicant as a way of mitigating that. Uh, whether we like it or not, the applicant was allowed by the court to amend the proposal, um, you know, I guess significantly than what was originally considered by the Joint Regional Planning Panel. Um, so that is the process. So I understand the question in as much as, yes, you would normally consider um, the requirement for a leachate barrier or a liner in relation to a landfill that um, has putrescible material, for example. Um, in this case, it is supposed to be clean material. So um, I guess there's more a question there that's hanging out there rather than able to be answered. Thank you, Mr Muir. Does that help you, Mr yes. uh, Councillor Marnie? Yes, thank you thank very you. much. I'll just make one last statement. And, um, look, I understand Councillor Goodsell's uh, concern about the placement of that statement and perhaps it should be better placed in the commentary. However, I too, like Councillor Coleman, endorse that statement that uh, that there is a certainly a long-term position. I've heard it repeated continuously over years uh, that this council oppose the importation of Sydney waste to the Lithgo local government area. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. No. Anybody else wishing to speak? Right of reply, Councillor Coleman. Uh, Councillor Lizzie. If I could. On, on page uh, 11, there's uh, the, the amendments to the proposed development include, and there are nine dot points there. I believe they're fairly meaningless. The, the, dot, the first one, the dot point, reduction in the amount of fill from 1.2 M. I assume M is actually million. million. <laughs> so reduction in, in the amount of fill from 1.2 million cubic metres to 1 million cubic metres. Now that sounds impressive, but it won't take effect until 1 million cubic metres has actually been filled in. So it's at the end of the process in, in 10, 20, 30 years time, whenever it is. So in the meantime, those, those massive fleets of, of uh, trucks from Sydney up, up the Great Western Highway, you know, up and back, up and possibly up through uh, the, the Bells Liner Road, up and back, will continue unabated, you know, at the time. So that's, it, it, to me, it's not, uh, not a very useful proposed amendment. Uh, the others, I, don't, I won't go through them all, but the capture of any water that comes into contact with emplacement material in a contact water pond for reuse on site. <laughs> well, we've just seen what floods do. Uh, no, no pond on the site is going to be any use if we have any any form of floods. I mean, but if we have have a similar one, and and they're not one in a thousand year floods. I mean, I'm talking about one in five year floods or one in five one in a year floods. I mean, they this will happen all the time. It's not. It's, and of course. The, the fall of the, the dam, you know, the, the, the site gets, you know, the, the less storage capacity you'll have. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, the amended proposal was, well, if it is assessed by the Land Environment Court, I believe that we should. Therefore, it's not going to come a report, but I think we're preparing for the land revoke, not preparing a report to the council.
open sort here uh, coming before the council and engaging with you. Uh, we need um, we need very acute um, actions that speak to government, but also speak to the private sector. Uh, we need a real a real clarity, and we need to resonate with the private sector. But we need to um, to very much have uh, the 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 right economic future that is correct for this place. Um, so yes. I recognise the expense, but I see it as a really important piece of work um, during the term of this council. Thank you, Mr. General Manager. Anybody else wishing to speak? Councillor Goodsell, right of reply. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Unanimous. Thank you. 10.3 Infrastructure Service Reports Great Western Highway Upgrade. I'd like to move um, a point two. If, I'm happy to point one, but I'd like to put, move a point two. Oh, hang on. Point two, point. Yeah, I actually, I'd like to change point two. Sorry, let me correct that, Mayor Statham. I'm happy with point one, but I'd like to delete point two and, and, and put something else there. I'm happy to second once I hear. You and you may not. You uh, so, Councillor Coleman, could you clearly state what you would wish to do? Thank you. Yeah. So, I'm moving point one. I'm yes. deleting point two, but I'd like to move something else instead of point two. And this is my point two instead of. Does that All make right. sense? Yes. That Lithgow Council requests the New South Wales Government to indefinitely defer the upgrading of the Great Western Highway through the Hartley Valley as the damage to the environment and to the health and well-being of local residents is not for the is not is far less greater than any of the perceived benefits attributed to it by transport for New South Wales. I didn't think you would uh, could I have a second to thank you? Thank you, Councillor Leslie. Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mayor Statham. I, like other councillors, have received numerous emails from the residents, especially in Hartley. But one in particular email from uh, Stephen Steed caught my attention for other reasons. He stated that the Central West region is the only New South Wales region without a highway or high efficiency, efficiency road transport access to the Sydney markets. And I dwelled on that for a little bit. This highway is going to cost $2.5 billion, potentially for broad regional benefits, saving 10 minutes in traveling time. And that's what it states in the report. I'm an elected Lithgow city councillor. I stand for Lithgow. This upgrade is, is about ensuring that Sydney traffic continues to use Lithgow as a gateway to Bathurst, Orange or Mudgee. We want them to stop here. We don't want them whizzing past us. Lithgow at the moment, and it really upset me, is often made comment, Lithgow is, is only known as the fast food restaurants on the highway as they continue west, which isn't good enough for us. Transport New South Wales has not provided any cost benefit to spending taxpayers' money on saving some travelling time. And I really doubt that it actually is 10 minutes. I actually think it's probably only about six. What really concerns me is that both the Australian and the New South Wales government have recognised the project as a significant piece of infrastructure, but they haven't addressed the pinch point at Blackheath. It is to be dealt with at the latest stage of this project. Sydney travellers on a Sunday afternoon, a realm of the high efficiency road, are going to get stuck at Blackheath. Transport needs, New South Wales needs to go back to the drawing board. Of course I'm in support of improvements to the Great Western Highway, but not to the economic derriment of Lithgow and its villages and towns. This won't achieve what they're claiming it will do, 
I personally have travelled the road on several occasions and have often been blocked at Blackheath, irrelevant of the weather patterns. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Councillor Leslie, will you accept that? On that point that Councillor Coleman would like to delete and the one that she would now like to wish to include? Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. And, uh, I reserve my right to speak to the motion. Yes, may. yes, certainly. Anybody else wishing to speak against this motion? For this motion? Against. Against? Against Councillor Coleman's amendment, is it? Um, yes, you can speak against that now. Is that what we're doing? No, we're speaking to the motion at the moment. That's correct. Anybody else wishing to speak? So just to be clear for all the councillors, there's only one motion and the, the original motion uh, was a, was added to. Yes. So the officers recommended to was overtaken by Councillor Coleman's. So where are we up to now? So does that mean in principle that we're, we're sending this off to say that we don't, we want to put a, a hold on it currently? That is that the motion that we're voting on? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to speak against that. I would like to speak against it too. Yeah. You go, you go first, Stuart. Yeah, Councillor Burton McGee. Yeah, thank you, Minister Stephen. Um, no, I think the progress is progress. It's a Great Western Highway. It is a arterial road to the west, and to have it sitting on 80 kilometres an hour is an insult. We just spent a fortune upgrading it and took the speed limit back to allow for Hartley and all of the um, people living there, and that's fair enough. So it's already been dropped from 90 to 80 with a massive improvement of the road. And yeah, no, it, this needs to go through. That's It's an unbearable part of the journey. And um, yeah, the tunnel will fix Blackheath. That's on its way. So, you know, it's an integral part of, of just making, and then people will be so much, they will be arriving at Lithgow. And as we clean up our aesthetics, people will turn off. They will go down the main street. You know, that's why we're doing this work on the main street to invite people in. But yeah, it's, I think it's essential that it go ahead, not be deferred at all. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Councillor Goodsell. Um, thank you. I don't support the um, the number two as well. I think this project is a state significant project. Doesn't matter what we say, uh, what we do, it is going to go ahead. And it's important that we have a seat at the table with the 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 ref, which is some ridiculous amount of documents, and council staff have pulled that apart to find out a way that we can work beside HDPA and their recommendations and, and get a, a, a more substantial, well-considered um, proposal, hopefully with, with the representations that the general manager is going to make on our behalf. Um, I certainly, it's going to it's going to come whether we like it or not. If we stamp our feet, um, there's going to be a, a big long road in another 20 years. It goes 100 k's an hour all the way to Sydney, and and this is the first part of it. It baffles me why they start here because there is no congestion at Hartley, but I can possibly see the bigger picture um, in into the future. But I certainly um, will support the the report that the general manager is going to write with the recommendations that Mr Edgecombe's included in this. Thank you, Councillor Goodsell. So the actual... Mayor, if I might just um, briefly, we, um, if the motion is lost as it stands, um, we're in a bind because, you know, the, this, the point two goes to making a submission. So, um, uh, the, the current motion is um, is merely that we defer the matter. So I just bring to council's attention um, that should the, should that motion um, succeed, we'd be left without in, in a bit of a quandary in terms of making a submission. So you know there needs to be a decision made about an, the original or an amendment. If I could speak in favour of the, the motion, it's it's not. Point two. Councillor Leslie, you have oh, already spoken. You've no, already no, I agreed. You, you, you agreed asked, with Councillor Coleman. I asked if I if my if I could reserve my right to speak. Okay, go on then. Sorry. Point 
Point two of Councillor Coleman's motion was that we ask, uh, the, we ask the state government to indefinitely defer the construction of the upgrade of the, of the Great Western Highway through the Hartley Valley. It's not asking for the deferment, indefinite or otherwise, it's not asking for anything about the construction of the Great Western Highway tunnels. Uh, and, and of course, if those tunnels are built, then you may well need to consider some upgrade of the highway through the Great, through the Hartley Valley. But until the tunnels are built, as Councillor Goodman, as Councillor Goodsell just said, there is no congestion in the Hartley Valley. So you're, you're building this enormous road at, at an enormous expense to achieve nothing. It doesn't achieve, uh, oh, sorry, it, it achieves an increase in speed from 80 kilometres to 100 kilometres. That's, that's all it achieves. Now, of course, we know at the moment that from Lapston to Mount Victoria, the maximum speed is 80 kilometres. And of course, going through some of the villages and school times, it drops to 60 and, and 70 and 60 and, and, and school times can drop down to 40. But suddenly, suddenly we need to get through the Hartley Valley at 100 kilometres an hour. Well, it, it doesn't, doesn't make sense to build this road with its enormous overpasses, its enormous uh, construction costs. We end up with a with the existing highway that becomes part of council's responsibility, a cost to council. It's a, it's a huge burden. But let me just give you an idea of, of just what, we talk about billions, 2.5 billion, or 2,500 million. Billions and billions, it just seems to, they just become, they all sound the same. But this government would give 100,000 truck drivers, $10,000 each, and would still have 1.5 billion to spend on hospitals. That's what, that's what this road's costing. That gives you an idea of the enormous waste of money that's going on this thing. Why? To give truck drivers 10 minutes extra. You know, a saving of 10 minutes. I'm always amazed at just how little benefit it takes for someone to get 10 minutes in this case. It takes before, you know, people, communities, organisations are prepared, you know, to ruin the life and well-being of, of other people. It's, it, it's just mind-boggling. I mean, the people who are left beside this road in the Hartley Valley. They'll have to live with it forever or move. The heritage is there. The, the, the value of, of, the, of, the, of the community and the environment down there, it's, it's important. It's a, it's a pristine area, the Hartley Valley. And yet we want to put this road through that just, just straight through, you know, and it's, it's just not worth it. It's, it's not worth it. Wait, wait till it's needed. Wait till they've actually done the work, which I doubt they'll ever do. But let's wait and see, give them the benefit of the doubt. Wait until they've built the tunnels at, you know, bypassing Blackheath. Now, I've travelled many times to Lithgow, uh, to, to Sydney, uh, and I've been caught in traffic jams many times. And, and the traffic jam generally starts at Blackheath, going to Sydney, starts at Blackheath. It's still there at Katoomba. You travel right through, through the mountain towns and that traffic jam is there until you get to Strathfield. That road, no matter how big it is, can't cope with the traffic that's on it. It's a two lane road. And no matter what you do in the Hartley Valley will make absolutely no difference to the to the speed and to the access to the mid midwest all you're doing is making it easier for tourists 
uh, people wanting to go home at, at long weekends, for trucks, anyone, all they're doing is making it easier to get to the traffic jam. It achieves nothing. And $2.5 billion could well be better be spent on hospitals, on, on all sorts of infrastructure, paying for this, paying for this pandemic. I mean, tell, tell, the, tell the, the government ministers and, that you can, you can start saving the, you know, the, the government's budget. And here's, here's a place to do it. Start where the people in Hartley don't want it and it will achieve nothing. Thank you, Councillor Lizzie. Is there anyone else wishing to speak for the motion or against the motion? No, sorry. May I ask a clarifying question? Yes. So the way it sits at the moment, does this mean with uh, Councillor Coleman's dot point two that we will not be able to make these submissions uh, on behalf of Council? No, not if her motion is lost. Not if her... Yes. This will be put to a vote, Council Goodsell. Yes, it will be put to a vote. Thank you. Put the motion. By way of clarification, if the motion is won, the position of the Council is absolute. Um, their, their position is um, singly um, to request the, count, the government to indefinitely defer the upgrade of the Great Western Highway. The issue, well, if, if the motion succeeds, that is the effect. The council's position will be to indefinitely, to request the government to indefinitely defer the upgrade of the project. Motion loses. We have no guidance from the council in the form of it, the, what the submission should take. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour of Councillor Coleman's motion. Uh, sorry, can I? Sorry about that. Can I speak to this uh, before? Because I, I, I'm somewhat concerned where, where we've arrived at. Um, so I just need to be clear. I, I suppose, like Councillor Goodsell, um, I, I, I think we need to be bring. Oh, geez. Okay. Sorry. My apologies. Like Councillor Goodsell, uh, I have a number of significant concerns about this proposal. I'm not sure how they're getting captured through this proposal. Are we dealing with the issues with the inappropriate truck stops in the Hartley Valley? Through, are we, uh, and my, my concern is whether we, if we're not putting a position forward from council, is that what we're suggesting is a possibility? Um, council already has a position on the truck stops. Uh, in the previous council, but I'm happy to listen to anything that you have to say. Certainly, in regard to the truck, truck stops, I understand the uh, chain of responsibility in the heavy trucking industry and the requirement to manage fatigue of drivers, but those locations in the uh, Hartley Valley are not appropriate for where they're located. I've also got a number of concerns about other elements of this proposal. I agree with the the discussion around rushing to a constriction point. I'm just coming off the back of 32 years of using the Great Western Highway pretty much Monday to Friday and Saturdays. I can sometimes drive it four times in a day. The clear constriction point in my mind sits at Blackheath. It sits at Soldier's Pinch and it extends through Medlow Bath and until you hit the double lanes of West Katoomba. I don't understand the order of this proposed work it doesn't the project logic just isn't there for me why we will build this and rush people to a constriction point um, the other concerns is i've got two hot spots that are, are bothering me uh, surrounding the harp of erin and that significant heritage landscape that we're going to have that placed on a medium strip almost effectively as as was described earlier on with a four lane, 100 kilometre road behind it and another road in front of it. Those sort of impacts on that heritage, as well as when we get to Hartley, um, a historic village, we find we've almost got eight lanes of pavement where we've got the existing highway service roads plus an additional four lane, 100 kilometre road going through there one of the most significant heritage sites west of the Blue Mountains. 
Um, I'm just not seeing the project logic in this. We've recently had an upgrade, which has upgraded the road. I have not ever been stuck in Hartley, except for the occasion when a 15 metre piece of asphalt guttering failed just east of the uh, railway bridge at Mount Victoria. That's what closed the highway for days. It wasn't a the need for the modernisation. For some reason, we we decided to come to a point where we cut short about 30 metres of concrete gutter. And that was the reason that Friday night that everyone sat up in the Blue Mountains for hours was a maintenance issue, not a, not a road design issue. So again, I don't understand the project logic of rushing to those constriction points. So my inclination is sitting with Councillor Coleman's suggestion that until those issues are resolved, that we should indefinitely defer this. I certainly can't support the truck stopper uh, situation there. And uh, I'm not also, I'm also not convinced by the, uh, the cost benefit analysis that's occurred. Uh, the amount of money that's going to be spent for the time saving is, is again, I, I, I'm, it, it's beyond me. So I understand the why people want safer roads and all of the upgrades in the Blue Mountains over the last 32 years result in safer roads. They don't necessarily result in faster travel time. I actually think there's a bit of a myth sitting there. The Woodford Bends became much safer. The Middle Mountains became much safer. The Katoomba area became much safer. The risks still sit in Medlow Bath to Blackheath and that's where we queue when we, when we go eastbound and it's generally an eastbound issue. So I'm just concerned and my apologies if I'm a first time councillor and I'm not quite understanding the, the possibilities how this procedural pathway is going, but I, I don't want to have a situation where this council is not expressing those concerns to the state government. So, so that, that's all I'd like to say. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. Right of reply, Councillor Coleman. Uh, no, Mayor Statham, let's just have the motion put, please. I'll put the motion. Those in favour of Councillor Coleman's motion? Against? The motion was lost. Thank you. Can we have the names spread out as you, what is usual practice? Absolutely. Thank you. Those in favour? Councillor Marnie, Councillor Coleman and Councillor Leslie. Those against? Councillor Goodsell, Councillor McGee, Councillor Marnie, Councillor Goodwin. Sorry. Councillor Bryce. Councillor Bryce, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, may I ask a question then? Do, do we go back to a, uh, the original recommendation? No, it's gone. So can we make another recommendation? No, you have. There'll have to be a notice of motion back to council. You have to. You have. I, I, Mayor Statham, if I could please get advice from the general manager. My understanding is that a notice of motion would have to come back, or it'd have to be foreshadowed. Can we get some advice on that, Mr. General Manager? options are um, this motion or precision motion. Thank you. Item 10.3.2, results of negotiation process, replacement of the Glen Davis Road bridges. Happy to move. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Happy I have a second. second to thank you, Councillor Goodsell. Um, the general manager has suggested if anybody in the audience chooses to leave, if, they can't, if their items have been dealt with, you're very welcome to leave, but you're also very welcome to stay. So, Councillor Coleman, would you like to speak to this? Uh, I think this is a great report, a great uh, opportunity for, for um, Glen Davis Road. These bridges are definitely needed. 
And, um, yeah, I, it's really great that we got funding to proceed this, so that's all I really wanted to say. Council Goodsell? I have a question. Um, we have an amount of $5 million-ish to uh, that's uh, been allocated by the government. Uh, the three bridges are going to cost three and a half million ish. We've spent um, one hundred and sixty-two thousand. We've still got one million four hundred and something thousand left. What are we doing with that? Can I ask, please, Mr. Edgecombe? Through you, Mayor Statham. That one point four million ish uh, will be likely. We will have that allocated to aspects of the project uh, that. Mostly project contingency. We'll have a lot of project management costs allocated to that amount, um, but it'll cover us as a uh, as essentially insurance against any rises in costs between now and commencement of construction, any unforeseen latent site conditions that we don't expect. Uh, so it, it's essentially going to cover us uh, as as the council to ensure that we don't overspend if there are unexpected circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Edgecombe. Councillor Leslie? Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's not quite on this issue, and I apologise for that, uh, Madam Chairman, but I've, I've received a number of, and I know the Council has as well, a number of uh, comments about lack of access and rights of way for, from people who at, uh, at uh, Glen Davis, and of course these bridges would may, may be part of it, but I was wondering if, we, if I could get some sort of up, update on on those issues. Mr. Edgecombe. It's, it's unrelated to this issue. Uh, the, 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 the right of access dispute is uh, on the Glen Davis Road after the three ways turn off towards Glen Davis. So it's completely outside the scope of these three bridges, but we, I, uh, council has, the administration has committed to the residents that uh, in due course, and we provided them with a timeline that the matter would be attended to. Thank you, Mr. Edgecombe. Anybody else wishing to speak? Council Goodwin? Yeah, this is a really good um, project. Uh, I just think communication is going to be the key down in the, um, down in the valley. Um, but they need to know exactly when and where and how they're going to come in and out of out of the valley once this work starts and they need to know well in advance and be updated all the time as has been mentioned in the um in the commentary thank you councillor goodsell anybody else wishing to speak for or against this just very briefly um just to acknowledge the previous council oh yes indeed thank you um obviously this is an initiative of the previous council that's something i would strongly support and I thank the councillors from the previous council for that and also Mr Edgecombe for your your work on resolving that issue with Glenn Davis which is a significant one so thank you. Thank you Councillor Marnie. Councillor Coleman right of reply. No I'm happy for the motion to be put. I'll put the motion all those in favour say aye. Against? Okay so uh, Councillor Rice is yes unanimous thank you. Water and wastewater reports 10.4. Water charge amendment for the remainder of the financial year. Happy to move. Happy, Happy to second. Move. Sorry, was that Army? Yep. If Councillor Sheldon's happy to. But if, yeah, Council I'm happy to. So Councillor Bryce has seconded that. Excuse me, Army. Right. Yep. Councillor Goodsell. Sorry, I think I might have taken that. But anyway, um, the most important thing about this is that we are make um, the communication to the community very, very clear that this is not a Lithgow City Council increase in their water charges for the, this period of time, but an IPART increase. Um, and we have no choice but to recoup some sort of um, this excessive increase. I just have a couple of questions through you, Mayor Statham. Yes. Um, why two thirds? Um, why, why are we recouping two thirds? Where is the extra third um, 
we just have to wear that? That's our first question. Uh, would you like to um, answer that? Thank you. Oh, Mr. Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, so we we we've put uh, we did modelling on three options, and we have recommended the uh, middle ground from memory, um, or, or towards the lower end of the the increase, bearing in mind the the impact on the customers, um, and also considering the. Um, amount available in the water fund reserve. So it's, it's short answer is which is trying to find a balance. That's why we've put that recommendation um, and we will be fully reviewing with um, water and wastewater department the fees and charges for the coming financial year. But at this stage, this is only until the end of June to recover um, much of the cost, but to find a balance as well. Thank you, Mr. Gurney. I haven't finished. Sorry, Count. Miss. Thank you. Um, how, how can this can this continue to happen? Can this happen again next year? The the IPART determination goes out to July 2025. So from this year, when it's been adopted by IPART, this um, will only go up with inflation or CPI value. Okay, last question. Sorry, this, so this will come out with clear communication from council saying that this is not our well doing, our, our, but we do need to recoup and we're possibly you know, taking a building for some of the increase. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be communicating with all the residents through me releases, water bills. Um, we'll be putting out as much information as we possibly can. Thank you, Mr. Trapp. Councillor Bryce? Um, I agree with... Councillor Goodsell, we just need to be transparent with um, our ratepayers and our water users that w the reason that the rate has gone up and um, that we are still copying a third of the costs. So that's all I've got to add to it. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bryce. Anybody else wishing to speak against this? For this, write a reply, Councillor Goodsell. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Ten point five finance and assets report. Happy to move, Mayor Statham. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Have a second, please. Councillor McGee, thank you. Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mayor Statham. Um, I just have a question, so I'm happy with the report and I'm wondering if we can is there a way that we can have is there a solar light opportunity? I know that this is talking about early days, I understand that, but do we have an opportunity across the city to use more solar lights? That's what I'd like to ask. Mr. General Manager? I think we'll take that question on notice and bring back information by way of memorandum in the first instance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. General Manager. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Councillor McGee? Anybody else wishing to speak for or against this? Right of reply, Councillor Coleman. No, I'm happy for the motion to be put, Mayor Statham. Motion. All those in favour say aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Ten point five point two, investment report, November two thousand and twenty-one. Thank you. Happy to move. No, and I apologise for not having a comment on this one. I usually uh, try to make one on everyone, and it's a really important um, an acknowledgement of, of um, Mr Gurney and his hard work, so apologies for not asking any questions. Councillor McGee? Anybody else wishing to speak for or against? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Unanimous, thank you. 
10.5.3, Investment Report, December 2021. Mr Gurney, have a move, thank you. I'm happy to move it, Mayor Statham. Have a second to thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Councillor Coleman? No, I think the report speaks for itself, Mayor Statham. Thank you. Councillor McGee? Anybody wish to speak for or against this? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. 10.5.4, rebate requests, excessive water accounts. Mr Gurney, could I have a mover for this, please? Happy to move. Thank you, Councillor Goodsell. Have a second to thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Mr Gurney, uh, well, first of all, um, Councillor Goodsell. Um, no, unfortunate um, experience for those two residents, in particular the first one. Um, I just have a question. Uh, obviously, it's exorbitant amount for someone to have to pay and we should reimburse them. But we used to, I don't know if it was just practice or um, we used to have a lot of these come to council whether the smart meters um, eliminated a lot of those leaks. Is that is that the case, Mr. Tra Sorry, through you, Mayor Slater. Yes, that's fine. So the, the smart meters allow us to have like, similar to an early detection system. When we have um, leaks that are over 10 litres an hour, we have that set as a, a minimum um, to be able to send that out. We push out, push out letters and get in contact with the owners via letters, texts, whatever means we have and whatever de through whatever contact details we have. But yeah, look, the smart meters have stopped a lot of this because we have that early detection system. We used to have a couple of months going back a little way, um, and we used to always compare them to the last three periods. Does that mean that these periods didn't have any? They didn't have any activity on them. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Anybody else wishing to speak for or against? Just a quick, Marnie. Just a quick comment uh, through the. Uh, Mr. Mr. Trapp, um, yeah. Look, I I agree with your um, system. I've been the recipient of your notices of a, a leak, and that's been particularly helpful because in the past it would have just been something that would have run indefinitely, and then we find out sometime later that there's a significant you know water use that was that could have been intervened on. So I think the system. I'm seeing evidence of it working out there. So I, I think it's a good initiative. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. Right of reply, Councillor Goodsell. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Against, unanimous. Thank you. Page 48, business of great urgency. I'll declare the meeting Actually, closed. Actually, sorry. Yes. I just, that just flashed into my mind. I'm so sorry. Um, mine was uh, if we could please be on the front foot with the Lithgow Anzac Day celebrations. There's, they're going to be coming up. We copped a Heidi. I sound like Joe Smith saying I've copped a flogging <laughs> over that, but we certainly did. And if we can uh, extend a, an arm to those organising that Lithgow in particular, the other seems to, to be okay, but if we could get something going so that we do have an Anzac parade or ceremony of some sort this year, uh, reach out to the RSL subbranch, please. I have already spoken to the general manager, Council Goodsell. I think it's a great idea. We need to encourage Anzac Day. People were devastated last year when that was cancelled. I realise it was COVID and they'd lost some of their members, but let's reach out to them this month and get something organised for Anzac Day. Thank you. Could I say something, Mayor? Um, I'll rule that not as a matter of great urgency, but I'll deal that that be dealt with. Councillor O'Connor? Yes, I want to bring this to the uh, attention of Council. The New South Wales Government has announced 200 million multi-sport government facility fund. Now this closes on the uh, 22nd of February and I propose that uh, the Council look into it so we can do something with the uh, soccer fields and every other sporting facility. And there's also a part in there for, har <clears throat> for hardship 
if you say if you get five million, you're supposed to uh, produce uh, half of that. But because of the hardship, we might be able to get it for a lot of it. And it certainly needs to be uh, looked into if possible. Well, something also I think um, if that is uh, I do um, receive that as matters of great urgency. I think something that we've been trying to get here for probably 15 years is a big enough oval to have a football match in in um, Lithgow. I think we need to consider the Tony Lachetti's program having a big makeover and making that into a uh, a decent sort of an oval so that we can engage with football clubs and other different varieties of um, clubs and sporting clubs to host something like Mudgee Do and like Bathurst Do. We have the land. And the soccer fields. And the soccer fields, some. yes. And Mayor, I'm taking the ruling that is a matter of great urgency and we'll bring a report to yes. the information session of February given that closing date. So we'll, we'll bring information to that. Excuse me, Councillor O'Connor, what was the closing date to that? 22nd of February, I think. It's not far. Right, that's very close. All right, thank you for that. Thank you everyone for attending tonight, for the people in the public gallery for attending, and for those people at home attending. Thank you very much. Finish, meeting finished at 10.40. Thank you very much.